This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Hello, hello, and jumbo, jumbo, everyone. And it's another very warm welcome on our sunrise drive. And you can see that beautiful eastern horizon where the sun at one point will be pushing up and you'll be able to see my very favorite what I've always called the golden hours, either in the morning or in the afternoon. You see all the torchwood trees there that make the Mara ever, ever beautiful. And that's part of the savannah of the Mara. My name is David, as always, and with me on camera is Manu. Manu, good morning, sir. And to all of you, buenos dias, buenas tardes, buenas noches, depending on where you are in the world. But for us, it's another lovely morning here in the Mara Triangle in Kenya. Uh, with degrees of 17 degrees Celsius, 63 degrees Fahrenheit. That kind of cloud or that kind of uh, sky to me is always giving me a feeling of good things happening. Yesterday, I'm sure for those of you who are following us, we had all the attraction happening or oh, wonderful sighting happening with my friend Pat and we'll be talking about those lions later. What we found for the first time maybe we had two prides that were fighting and apparently those two prides have one commonality. Their pride males are the same. They are what we call the three kicho males but yesterday we had two of those males. We had fang and we had the half tail. Quite a distance from where I am, but we shall be getting more update if either Patrick or Lauren may go back to the scene of crime later because there's so many things we still want to identify or unravel. What I'm trying to say is <clears throat> those two males must have fathered those cubs. So what happened, nobody knows because there was no reason for those cubs uh, to be killed if actually these were their genetical fathers. I personally think something was very wrong or something unusual or maybe something that has not been seen in the <clears throat> dynamics of lions. Because at one point, I also doubted, actually, if it is the males that killed those two cubs. I'm still a bit lost, so either we're going to be sending there some forensic experts later in the day and see whether we can tie all the dots together and find out exactly what happened. Because I looked at that footage much later, I didn't see any other males, just two. As I said, Fang and half tail. The third male has been missing. The last time the third male was seen had joined the Owino Pride and they were on some sort of kill. So why that happened leaves, I would say, so many questions than answers. But I'm sure before maybe the end of the day, we shall be knowing what transpired. Because to me, that was quite, quite unusual. I mean, lions, males do not kill their own cubs. Infanticide is very common. It has been going on every time. And I really want to congratulate Pat for having held his heart together in that very uh, sad, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't call it sad because to the animal kingdom, that is very normal. That happens every day. And I'm sure there are so many cases that we do not witness or see. But having captured that on camera, I would say it was very heartbreaking for Patrick. But I want to say, well done, Patrick. You're able to compose yourself and you did a very good job. Well, personally, I'm not visiting that particular area. I'll be going to my usual area. I'm sure you all know the Sausage Republic. Well, we had all these comments from the viewers who thought that it was the sub-adults of the other pride that could have done that. Now, apparently, there were two prides there. The Marsh Pride and the Ololo Pride. And Ololo is a much larger pride than the Marsh Pride. 
so and out here in the bush uh, numbers count a lot of course size and strength but for the marsh pride to have say bitten or pushed out and even bringing down those three cups of the all pride i got lost i got a bit confused but that's why i said we might be sending either some experts there later in the day to find out which sub adults are these because the good sub adults that i know that could have done that belong to the ololo not to the marsh fright so those a bit of uh, uh, I'll say lots of confusion in that particular area and I'm sure later on in the day we'll be finding out what exactly transpired. So we've got some giraffes here. I want to change that topic a bit because it still was a little bit sad but again as I said well done to Patrick for having held his act together. Now who are these very close to the road? Moon? All right, we want to say good morning to some tall animals here. So let me give Manu the angle he wants. Let me know when to stop. Keep going. Happy? Good morning, madam. Why are you so close to the road and you do not look worried by us? can see how tall the giraffe is and what man is trying to show is the height or the horizon of the sky against this very tall animal that we got here not only in Africa but the whole world and this is a Maasai giraffe girl chewing card hello there she looks very pregnant to me I could be wrong but that says of belly, I would want to bet and say she could be counting what, maybe nine months, ten months, baby, there, and having another four months to go. I like her courage. I mean, she's about barely three meters away from the road. And this is the beauty of what we do when animals can trust you, when animals can respect you, and vice versa. It's so good when they notice or realize that the homo sapiens are equally wonderful animals. Spora, you say this is lovely. I agree with you. And just to see that girl, Spora, there, chewing cud and being so composed, just not worried of her presence, and the sky, the eastern horizon, she's now happy, Spora, and she has said, I've given you enough setting. I am moving away. What do you think of my walking gait? Two and two, two legs of one side at the same time. We call that ambling. Most animals do amble, but I think giraffes have the best ambling gait of all of them. Why are you arcing your tail? Well, there's another giraffe there, apparently, sit down. Very, very good. Now, we have always given the giraffes Latin names of Camel Pudus and Camel coming from Camel and Pudus coming from Leopards. And I am not sure that Tristan wanted to talk of Leopards this morning. Well, I suppose we are going to talk about leopard since we've got a leopard that is doing what he did most of yesterday afternoon and is hiding away in the long grass. There you can see the spots of Tingana's side as he sleeps away in what can only be described as rather miserable weather, really. It is raining and cold and not very pleasant at all. Okay, it's not raining very hard, but it's this kind of misty rain that just makes everything damp, which is not very pleasant. Anyway, as um, David mentioned, my name is Tristan. On camera, I've got Craig this morning which you may not have even seen his thumb because it was that quick. Craig is definitely full of beans this morning and is uh, lightning fast with his thumb movements. But anyway, it's, we're going to hopefully see a little bit more kind of movement from Tingana today than what we had yesterday. Yesterday was 
not What's Tingana's that? finest performance. <laughs> he just lounged about in the thickest yeah, thicket he could what a and kind of lay you? and, and slept right next to his kill. And, and this morning, he was had his head up when we first got you, and it was actually fairly pleasant, but now he's kind of flopped himself down behind the most annoying branch that kind of cuts him in half. And because it's raining with the roof on, we can't really position in any other way to be able to show him better. Now, I'm very, 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 very surprised that there is no carcass in a tree anywhere and that he still possesses this carcass. I think he's had a number of things that have worked in his favor this morning, or during the night, should I say, that has led to the fact that he is now sitting here on the ground with his carcass on the ground and has survived a full night without being discovered. And I think the, the thing is, is that one, is the hyena de at the den yesterday, Craig was telling me, that, and, and so was Rusty, is that they were as obese as obese could be. Um, and so they obviously had fed incredibly well um, at some point yesterday. Uh, second thing is that it was, this animal was killed only yesterday, the kudu that Tingana's got. Um, and so that means it wouldn't have smelled too much. And that coupled with the fact that it was overcast, fairly rainy conditions, would have only helped to keep the smell kind of down if you want to call it that um, if it had been hot and, and muggy that smell would have really started or that meat would have rotted much faster and we would have had a much more kind of tension and the third thing i think is that the baboons that have been close by have been shouting at everybody that's moved past or they've been heard throughout the night um, and that maybe has just deterred some of the animals from walking around in this potential area um, and and potentially would have given Tingana a bit of a heads up so he's been lucky in that regard i don't think he can keep another night um, without hoisting it, but he should have eaten enough during the course of today, you know, or tonight, and I mean last night and today, to be able to then hoist it this evening and, and kind of feed off it. And it'll be really nice if he does hoist it, because the tree that he would hoist it into is, is quite pleasant, and we should get a far better view of the Duke than what we've been having in the last sort of two safaris. I'm also hoping that this morning with a bit of rain and things that are fall, is falling that the grass gets really damp and he decides to rather walk up onto the dam wall and lie there. Rob, you're saying he's being his senior citizen self? Well, I suppose. I suppose he's earned the rest, hasn't he? Not only has he patrolled this area for a number of years, um, it's quite scary to actually think that he's been kind of territorial in in this area for for the last sort of six to seven years i say six because when he first arrived here obviously it took him a bit of time until he settled as a territorial individual he was quite sort of nomadic to start with much like what hukumuri was um but even if you if you look at sort of six and a half years that's a long time for a male leopard to have been dominant let alone you know kind of moving around and so um he's earned the right to be a little bit sleepy and then you add into that that yesterday he managed to bring down a food item for himself and kill himself a kudu and, and for those of you that think he just stumbled across the kudu it's not the case um, some of the guests that were at Vuyatela camp actually saw it um, while they were having breakfast so just after we finished our morning safari remember we started much earlier yesterday morning and um, with the drone just after we finished our morning safari he uh, grabbed that little kudu and, and pulled it down in front of people that were watching so they most certainly knew that he had a kill um, and that he managed to do it himself so he's still got some fight in him so and I suppose that's breaks. taken it out of him a little bit and now with the full belly and overcast conditions the only thing to do is have a bit of a rest it's a proper bed weather morning if you ask me now the reason why I want to sit with him um, even though I know that the visual is not very good and obviously he's quite sleepy and he's got a meal and that's not really going to promote too much movement um, is that the baboons are starting to wake up yesterday afternoon we had the baboons right here on the dam all moving around um, and they then went towards the lodge and they've roosted up in the lodge and I can hear them now starting to slowly stir as the light is starting to get brighter um, no, no, no. It I can it's hear you, but uh, not the audio from the light. But, nothing. Um, as it's starting to become more and more sort of daylight, um, the baboons are starting yeah. to call and wake up. And I'm wondering if maybe they're going to come down and head this way. If they head this way today, it's going to be really interesting because yesterday the baboons didn't see Tingana at all. They walked right past him within, I would say, what? not even 15 meters so they walked incredibly close but they didn't spot him um, but you could see there was one male baboon that was looking in this direction and was very kind of cautious and knew something was up but wasn't quite sure 
Um, and so I wonder if they come this way now where Tingan is lying, he most certainly would be spotted. And it would be really interesting to watch the interaction between baboon and male leopard. I've seen some crazy baboon leopard mm -hmm. sightings before and it doesn't always go the way you think it would. Uh. Everyone always thinks leopard will charge in and chase baboons and the baboons will scatter in all directions and run away. It's not always the case. I once watched a sighting of four leopards. So it was Ravens caught her two male cubs and her older male cub called Shinzele. And they were walking down the road and they bumped into a troop of baboons and they got absolutely annihilated by this troop. They were chased up uh, trees, down trees, all over the place. And every single leopard ran for its life at that point. And those big male <laughs> baboons were not taking any of it. And so it will be really interesting to see whether or not these baboons come in. If they do, whether they're going to be sort of antagonistic towards him or if they're going to be defensive and try and move away. I also want to see if they do try and chase him, will they potentially then steal the kill? Because remember, baboons will eat meat as well um, and they can sometimes scavenge. And so it will be interesting to kind of see that interaction if the baboons do come and something that's worth kind of waiting for. So that's our plan for the morning. We're going to try and figure out whether that's going to happen. We can, like I say, can hear the baboons in the distance. They're not very far away. And so hopefully they're going to meander this way and across the damn wall and we might get some sort of interaction between them and Tinky because I don't think anything else is really going to wake him up. There's no sign of any hyenas coming this way. And so I think more than likely he'll be very, very sleepy unless the baboons start heading here. The other thing I suppose is that it is fairly overcast and fairly rainy, which means that there might be a potential for hyenas to be moving late in the morning um, and, and kind of being around. The other thing that's also I'm a bit surprised about by this morning is that Tandy is also um, not here because she was actually seen not too far from here, heading roughly in this general direction last night as drive finished. So Rusty bumped into Tandy on the way home and looked like her tracks came in this direction. Mm. So I was hoping to see both of them here, but alas, no sign. Now talking about Tandy, um, Oli is out and about this morning and he's on the search for the Queen and to see where she went. Good morning to you all. My name is Oli and joining us behind the camera is Seb from Kabul. So our mission for this morning is to look for Tandy, our queen, the lady who's 13 years old. So we heard that she's in this block. So we are trying to search and search and search. We are not lucky yet, but hopefully we'll give you a nice spotted Tandy sighting. So for any questions and comments, you can send them to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or YouTube chat stream. So it's still a little bit dark and... Um, I'm still using my spotlight. Hopefully you will find something. Oh, there's a scrap here, there, running. So she's in this block. She was last seen in this block. So because of the rain, since last evening, I think we won't be lucky with the tracks because I'm sure they are washed away. So what happened to at the Mara yesterday with Pat, it was heartbreaking. I couldn't watch more of that. I just switched off my computer. It was hectic to watch. But you know, that's uh, lion's instinctive behavior, if, you can, if I can put it that way. But I'm one of the sensitive person to watch, watch such events. So let me stop again so to have a nice lesson. So maybe I will hear the birds singing or alarming. So let's just keep quiet and listen. Nothing, nothing, nothing yet. I only hear the the green bat, Camaroptera. It's a small bird. 
no alarm calls and our roof is up and so if you see any poles on your screen we will are sorry for that on your screen we will are sorry but for I that. promise I will find this beautiful cat this morning and I wonder Tristan was was on leave and immediately after his arrival Tingana Kalamba Tandi all in the property he's really indeed a leopard whisperer do you agree with me So Tristan has found Tingana, so that gives me hope that I'll find Tandi. Where are you, Tandi? So if I'm not lucky with Tandi, I will go straight and check at the hyena den. Hopefully I'll find something there. Maybe we'll see the cops running around, being active. No, sometimes these few droppings can't stop the babies playing. So for now, let's listen and while I'm doing that, let me send you to Tristan with a sleepy Tingana. Well, good luck. I hope that you find the Queen and hopefully she's heading in this direction. It'd be quite nice to see the Duke and the Queen together once again. I'm, I'm very interested to see Tandy because Sebastian and Trishala tell me the last time they saw her that she was looking quite rotund and that she, they thought potentially she might have some sort of maybe be pregnant, but I would be interested to kind of see what she looks like. I, it's obviously very tricky to tell, particularly if she's only going to have one cub if she is pregnant. It's always very tricky to see until right at the end. So I'd be, I'd like to see the Tandy. I haven't seen her in weeks and weeks and weeks, in fact, months. Um, the last time I saw Tandy, I think, was in January. So it would be nice to catch up with her again at some point. So hopefully Oily can find her and we can kind of see how she's doing and maybe get some screenshots and things and figure out in the meantime though as you can see with Tingana he has lifted his head scratched his chin and proceeded to roll over and flop down the opposite way so he's now lying in a different spot but it's a slightly better spot I would say for us to watch a flat cat at least we can see his kind of body and his ears in the long grass and he's not hiding behind the stick anymore but he seems to be very very relaxed at this stage Michael, how long did it take Tingana to fully habituate? Um, Michael, it took a while. I'm not going to lie to you. It was probably... I, oof, now I've got to go back a long time to remember this. Um, a lot has happened in this many years. So I've got to remember exact timelines. But I seem to remember... I had a sighting of him just before I left Chitwa, which would have been 20, end of 2012. Um, and we started seeing him in 2011. And while he was much better, he was. Oh, he, we had him mating with um, Insele, and he was not having any of it. He kept running from the cars um, after mating with her. So he'd come and mate with her in front of the cars, and as soon as he had finished, he would realize, hang on a second, there's a whole bunch of people watching, and then he would run. And so that was already at the end. So it took probably a good year 
to get him fully relaxed. Um, and, you know, it was a slow process just because he he really didn't want anything to do with people. We used to see him and he used to be one vehicle and still skittish and kind of move from one side to the other and kind of dart into thickets and really try and actively lose you. And it was only when he actually started mating regularly with females and then also on top of that having big kills like something like a kudu um, that he really started to kind of get used to the fact that vehicles came around. And it took us, like I say, the first sort of, three four months he was a one vehicle sighting and then slowly but surely we started to see him more regularly at night and then two vehicles and eventually after about i'd say eight months to a year is when we actually got him to the point where three vehicles could find, be with him during the day and he would amble around rather than kind of trotting or trying to hide or something like that so it took quite a while um, a lot longer than let's say hukumuri remember when hukumuri first arrived he too was fairly shy and fairly kind of um nervous of, of cars off roading. I remember we had a sighting of him where he just didn't want anything to do with us when Scott first found him on foot and then we went in with the vehicle and we just we we, yeah, we couldn't get anywhere near him and he was kind of just zigzagging all over the place and just wouldn't settle. Um and then you look at him now, he's also very relaxed. So it depends on each leopard. Um but Tingi was quite a long time. It took us a fair amount to get him relaxed. And that's why he got the name he did, you know, is after six seven months of trying to get him relaxed and he's still shy that's kind of how he ended up in getting the tingana sort of name and it was i remember that whole process it was quite an interesting one because obviously tingana at that time was the name of shadow um on juma so a lot of people don't know that shadow was called tingana and and tundi was called saseka um and it, it, i don't know why the names were were changed and or why there was a difference in names i'm not quite sure um it was something to do with juma and then the other reserves and and then eventually you know tingana male became tingana um because everyone else knew shadow shadow on that side of on the western side of of juma and so kind of tandy kept her name and shadow kept hers and then they dropped the saseka and um and uh, Tingana name tags and it's so weird to think of a female leopard called Tingana now after spending so much time with male Tingana anyway right it's starting to get much lighter now um, the baboons are still kind of calling in the background so I'm hoping that they will come we're gonna have to be a little bit patient to start off this morning and um, hopefully they'll move in this area but in the meantime though let's send you off to David who's got spots that are far more active than these Well done, Tristan, and uh, you truly deserve that title of the leopard whisperer. And we've got different spotted animals here. <coughs> These are the spotted hyenas, excuse me. And not sure exactly what this clan could be, but uh, Manu is guessing it will be part of the North Clan by virtue of where they are. But it's more of a middle area between the North Clan and the happy zebra clan <coughs> excuse me again and not sure whether they're trying to get some bugs out of that one that has laid down there or it's the creepiness of how hyenas greet each other definitely not a way of greeting that way and could be a sign of submission maybe by the one that has gone down and whatever they were to do they either have finished circle Oh, are they trying to circle? Yeah, I'm wondering they're circling. I mean, this is just two cubs for a very small mama. They all look to be of the same size, eh? I'm surprised that such a small, I would say, hyena, she looks too small to be a mother. And those cubs, they look too big to be cubs. But yeah, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me again, I was just worried or not sure exactly what they were doing. That's very interesting to see such big cubs circle, but it's not unusual. I mean, they circle for a very long time. Sometimes they have been known to go up to 18 months uh, still, depending on the milk of their mothers, which is quite unusual for predators to do that. Most of them are always weaned very early, but hyenas in general, and most of the spotted hyenas, sometimes have even been known to go for two years still suckling.
excuse me, rather cold this morning. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, I might have met, forgotten to mention you to mention to you this morning. Comments and questions are always very, very welcome. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter because that's the only way we are able to engage. And not sure where she is going, but she's just walking towards us. And let's find out what she wants to do. As I said, I would guess this is part of the North Clan or the Happy Zebra Clan. Very majestic on the walk. Good morning. And just like we saw the giraffe earlier, they get, you know, sorry about my head. Let's just look at her as she walks past my right. Good morning. Mm. How are you? <coughs> sorry about my cough. Now, this has happened once in a while when these hyenas get very busy. So I just want to find out what exactly she wants to do. Hello there. Who is familiar here? Me or Manu? Manu has been dealing with these hyenas for a rather long time. And she's in fun. She's right there. And she looks very courageous. And she's just looking back at the ones that are circling in the middle of the road. And I'm not sure if she wants to go and rejoin them again. Hello. What are you sniffing? She's very close. She's just about two meters from the road. Alia, I was talking, it's such a good feeling when you see wild animals warming up with us. You saw the giraffe. It was very close to the road. Now we have a totally different type of animal. And this is a spotted hyena, which has come very close to us. And there she is walking away again. And I'm sure she wants to go and join the ones on the road there. Sorry again about my head. Let's just walk, see her as she walks back to join the two cubs that are still suckling. They must have been very hungry. I'm looking at them to be too big. Sorry, I missed the question from Sinazi there about the cabs. <coughs> She's just about to catch up with the other female that's still suckling those cabs. Ah, oh, very good. Sinazi uh, was talking earlier for how long uh, you know, uh, the hyena cubs will suckle. In general, it's anything between uh, 18 months to two years. They have been known sometimes to suckle up to two years, which as I was saying earlier, it's rather unusual or rather a very long time for cubs to suck, you know, or to nurse uh, for that particular period, which is a very long time. In general, most of the predators will win their cubs very early. But hyenas, and most of the spotted cub, the spotted hyenas, 16 months, 18, sometimes <clears throat> up to two years, it's very normal for them to keep suckling. And you can sell these two are uh, not living, are uh, not stopping to suckle in the near future. They must have been very hungry. And either the female, if not sure the female, I guess it's a female because hyena very matriarchal has gone on the side and joined them. And of course, it's safety in numbers. And there's another one popping up there. There's another member who looks to me pretty young, much younger than the ones that are suckling. I'm surprised. You see that one? See how dark she got her cubs, her spots rather. Very smallish. Could that be the mother? And another one coming out. Ooh, those are two tiny, tiny ones. So that is what I would be expecting to be suckling. And maybe this could be their mother. I do not know. Let's find out if they also may join the other two in suckling. And this might remind me of the synchronized suckling of lions. And maybe these ones don't look very hungry. We want to go to the other mama who is already suckling her cubs. We haven't seen hyenas allo suckling. I'm talking of, you know, female hyenas suckling other cubs. Personally, I haven't seen.
Jeanette, good question. Now, <clears throat> these two you see moving here, <clears throat> they're not, it's not mad on them, it's their age. Apparently, when hyena cubs are born, they are all one color, black, black. And at the age of about two and a half to three months, the spots will start appearing. So that genet is not mud. That's their natural color. As you've seen, another female or rather another hyena popping up. Always very difficult to tell males from females, but just my quick guess, all this would be female. So genet, that is their natural color. And when they're young, they're all one color, which is black. Two and a half going to three months, spots will start showing. But of course, we know sometimes they love playing in the mud, but this is not the age I would expect to be mud wallowing. But looking on their legs, they look rather dark. So I would just think this is just their natural color. Now, Jeanette, if you look at the two that are suckling there, you see they are not as dark because my guess is they are a lot older. They are way over maybe five, uh, six months or thereabouts. Now, these two, we need to see one of the females here either suckling them and they do not seem interested. <coughs> Cookie, good question. Can I smell the hyenas when they're this close? Well, I'm looking at about 20 meters from where they are, Cookie, but we've got such a wonderful camera that it seems they're like just next to us. Now, being early in the morning, maybe they haven't started, you know, smelling. We haven't had so much sun or heat on their bodies, but many people will always say hyena smell, and they have got such a strong pungent, such a strong stench. But as it is, as far as I'm concerned, zero. Everything's still smelling very fresh from where we are because again it's still very early in the morning now none of those two other adult hyenas want to suckle the young ones i can't see those other two that Jeanette was asking whether they were full of mud or it was their natural colors either they have gone to some warmer grass just to keep themselves warm and i can see them on the other side of that one particular hyena the one that's farthest away from your screen and definitely that's not a suckling position. Well, the road is a bit warm, and that is where they're there. <clears throat> very good, very good. Now we are talking of lots of hyenas this morning, lots of predators, Tristan Hard, the Le Lepertingana. I have hyenas here, but I think Oli is trying to compete with Amara because he might have also gotten a hyena for himself. Yes, I'm trying to compete with the Mara, but I only have this one hyena which is sleeping. This hyena, I think it's a ribbon, You're looking at the coloration, because I can't really see all the features to identify this hyena. He's lying nicely there. You can see she's in a little bit of a uh, hole. That's what uh, animals do. I've seen dogs doing this. They dig, they dig, they dig, and then they sleep in the... Hello, good morning. Oh, uh, looking at this face, the left ear. I think this is ribbon. Definitely this is ribbon. Do you agree with me or not? Yes, this is a ribbon. What a nice, cute face there. So Ribbon was born 2013 and she currently has two cubs that are still black and less than two months old. Hello. Oh, she's very full. You really deserve a nap. No cups out yet. Oh, this is cute. She's so lucky because she's very full and there's no cup bothering her. <coughs> so, 
So this uh, hyena belongs to this clan called the Juma clan of hyenas. He's, she's one of the low-ranking females in the clan. And interestingly, if you if you know Ntima, Ntima, it's one of the of the members of this clan. Her first litter was Ntima, which is a female, and one possible litter who's known as Lamula, but Lamula vanished. seems as if she has eaten the whole impala. Oh, this lion, this hyena is sleepy. So what I'll do is, I wasn't lucky with with Tandy, but I won't lose hope. I will leave this area because it's more sleepy and I will search to the eastern direction, to up, up to the south direction. So for now, let's leave this sleepy hyena and go to Tristan with his sleepy cat. I see the baboons between everything but they are slowly starting to kind of move around in this direction and Tingana is not impressed by it at all. He's kind of watching what's going on and is very very much um, annoyed by the fact that baboons are around he's kind of crept himself into a little thicket so as the baboons don't shout at him there's one baboon that is um, quite high up on a branch that's sort of on the dam wall itself um, and he's just kind of looking around and so Tingana's watching him you can just see him there on that branch there so that's a big male baboon that's sitting and watching and he's kind of just staring at it having a look and can you hear the baboons a little bit? Making a bit of noise. So Tingana is trying to kind of hide away from them. He doesn't want to attract the attention of these guys. And the reason why I was saying to you earlier is that baboons will actively chase leopards um, when they want to. They'll sometimes kind of go after them and they could potentially even steal his meal, which is pretty incredible when you think about it. You would think that baboons wouldn't be a scavenger from a leopard, but it can happen from time to time. Now, unfortunately, with the way the roof is and, and everything else, it's very tricky for me to show you where Tingana is. The way that he's moved has made it a little bit tricky to actually see him. He's kind of gone to the right of where my roof is, and so I don't think Craig is going to get much view of him but he's amazing how he kind of leopard crawled himself so he kept his belly right down on the ground and slowly crawled his way along into a thicket in order to try and hide away particularly from those baboons that are trying to sit up high and almost like little sentries that are able to kind of spot what's going on you can see how high that baboon is going now unfortunately that's our roof that's getting in the way Craig let me just slowly turn you a little bit so that you can see Tingana a bit better you can just kind of make him out over here um, so that should help Craig a little bit unfortunately like I say the roof is on so you see how he's got his head kind of down he's really trying to make sure that he is as well hidden as possible um, and that's purely because the baboons are getting up into the trees and he knows if one baboon sees him there's going to be that shouting that's going to take place there's going to be a really kind of loud bark um, which is going to indicate that he's here and then they're going to start coming and investigating and particularly the big males they're going to get very very excitable and then you're going to find that they're going to be quite upset about the fact that there is a leopard around and it could go either way then either they can scatter and run away or they can come and challenge him Um, would Tingana go after a baboon? Well, um, probably not. Uh, the risk of, of going after baboons is one that will probably result in some sort of injury. They, they do do it every now and then if they are desperate and in certain areas where food is not as easy to come by, 
Well, a baboon is a is a potential food item, and so they will. And and big males um, like Tingana are probably the ones that would would go after it. Um, or if they can find a young one that's on its own, they'll kind of grab it and, and try and rush off. But generally, they're quite wary of baboons. You'll find most times um, leopards will try and kind of avoid baboons. It's not worth the risk. Remember, baboons have a serious set of canines and jaws, and the fact that there's lots of them can often be quite dangerous for a leopard so you know it's it's a an animal that is not really worth the risk if if that can kind of the way that you can put it um, much easier to go and hunt things like um, you know impalas and kudus and dikers and the likes that are you know far less able to defend themselves than what something like a baboon is so we're going to just try I think reposition ourselves slightly because there's another vehicle that's just coming to the sighting and we the way we positioned are blocking everything for everyone so just going to see if we can move sli ever so slightly um, let's just try and I'm going to just try I don't want to go too far forward because his kill is right at the base where I am here so I've got to just try and kind of left hand down us quite heavily so once they're in position and I'm just going to try and come back a little bit there we go good there we go so we're all good now they can see and so can we um, and so that will be a lot better. Now you can see Tingana is still going to hide. We're going to sit with him a little while longer. We'll see if the baboons come closer. And in the meantime, up you go to David, who's on search for the lions. Very good. I mean, uh, baboons and leopards have never been friends. They have never been friends, and they're not going to be friends today. Sorry about the dust there, Manu. But you have always known, you know, baboons going for leopards and leopards going for baboons. Now, leopards have also been known to go for birds to feed on, and <clears throat> this is one of them. They have also hunted birds like uh, bastards, like this particular one. This is called black-bellied bastard. Just two seconds, I catch up with my friend. Nikolai, make it on your Sorry, that's a friend of mine, and we'll always compare notes, you know, what have you seen, what haven't you seen. So I just told him there were some nice, wonderful hyenas by the road, and what we were speaking is our local language uh, called Swahili. Kenya is a country with over 40 tribes and about 45 different dialects. So uh, Swahili is our national language and that's what we use to communicate. So we'll always compare notes very quickly, the direction was coming from, what did you see behind? But he just told me he saw some jackals and then I told him I saw some hyenas, which I thought my hyenas were more appealing. We have uh, concurrently agreed with Manu, uh, who is filming with me today that those hyenas were from the North Clan. They were so relaxed with us. She came very close to the car, went back, and the ones we saw circling on the road, even as we passed them, because they were right in the middle of the road, I'm sure you saw on your screens, we had to move in the grass. They did not stop circling. But the most interesting thing that I found out, because I stopped like literally two meters from where they are, those cubs are the same size as their mother. And that's why initially I wasn't sure what they were doing, but I have seen them and confirmed they are or they were suckling. And let me see if we stop here. I just saw the dogs or the jackals this friend of mine was talking about. Is that good man? We'll keep going. Uh, my friend, I hope he's going to see the hyenas I promised him because he also promised me or he just told me he have seen some dogs behind and I think these are the dogs he was talking about. The black backed or the silver backed jackals. Hello there. What a day it is today. All his moving tools. He's out of the frame. And let me see how far he has gone. Money, if you look here, sorry, 
I mean, in this particular bush here, in, I think they must have killed, you know, they, they seem to have been eating something and I guess they must have killed a bird. There's so many feathers there and the one we just saw feeding, either there's some sort of bird they must have killed because there's a lot of feathers there and that particular area looks to be very disturbed. So most likely, whatever it was, it was brought down there. You see all those feathers there? I wouldn't be able to know. I would guess maybe it could have been a dove of some sort. That's what they could have killed early this morning. and Or someone has killed it and they're finishing on it. Yeah, definitely all those feathers tells you that someone was brought down there. Very good. Let's keep going. I think that was a good gentleman having told me, he, I have seen some dogs behind. And then I told him, I've seen some hyenas. Hopefully he will see the hyenas because I have seen his dogs, which are black-backed or silver-backed jackals. Yeah, no, those hyenas were from the North Pan. We have confirmed that 100% from how comfortable they were, you know, with us by the roadside. But still, I'm very, uh, I've been very impressed that that mother is still suckling such huge cubs. Those cubs and that mother are of the same size, which is quite interesting. I see those other two little cubs there that were dark and full of uh, black spots uh, who are not suckling. And I, I guess that should be the suckling age for hyenas. So North Clan uh, relocated. We all know that uh, Lauren has been following them very much and most likely should be out this afternoon. Daniel, how are you? And you're asking whether jackals are related to foxes. Jackals, foxes, wild dogs, uh, or canida is all that huge family and they are all sort of dogs. And you're right, they are related to their foxes and to the wild dogs. So they are all related. And also to the bat-eared foxes. So the dingoes, foxes, and the coyotes all belong to that one huge family and they are all related. The European fox and I guess the North American fox and here in Africa we got the wild dogs and we also got the Ethiopian wolf. They are all related in that big, big family. Good question and always good to hear your name, Daniel. I have said every day I have gone out, I have not missed an elephant. Snazi, you are asking, do jackals have dens? Yes, Snazi, jackals, two things they have. How oh, we know about jackals? Number one, uh, they're very monogamous, Snazi, jackals. And number two, they do have dens, just like hyenas. So Snazi, jackals do have dens. And you might go to a den of jackals, snazi, and get about five, six jackals together. As much as I'm saying they are monogamous, you'll only see a male and a female. But you might see cubs, you might see small little uh, uh, youngsters of jackals with maybe three adults or four adults and wonder you're saying that jackals are monogamous. What jackals will do, you'll have of course one pair, a male and a female, and then they'll always bring in other fully grown helpers to, you know, just help raise the youngsters. Yes, they do go dance, and once in a while we have seen them in the dance. The only thing is, Nazi, they keep moving the dance every other time. Unlike the hyenas, which may have, you know, fixed dance for a very long time, and hyenas will always uh, relocate their dance for very good reasons. Manu, who is this here on top of this tree? Well, we have a bird of prey here. How are you? And uh, exactly, I'll be sending a tweet. Hashtag Safari Live. Who 
do you think uh, this particular bird of prey is? I have been seeing uh, here the last four days in the same tortu tree, and there have been two. Today she is or he is alone. So my question to you, who do you think this is? Tweet hashtag Safari Live on Twitter to David and tell David who do you think this is? You have all the uh, ID marks there, the orange feet, the orange beak, the bluish, duckish color on the feathers, and they normally tend to patch at the very top of trees. Either they have been mating because there have been two here the last four days, so I'll give you only one clue and I'll tell you she or he is a hawk. So what hawk do you think this is? It's a hairy hawk. Very close, very close, but not quite, not hairy hawk, because hairy hawks are quite big, quite big, and you rarely see them in such open areas. You do, but they tend to be a little uh, thicket, and hairy hawk, when you see them patched on trees, you always see that they've got no balances. You'll always see like their knees are wobbly, so you'll always see them moving left, right, and not as still as this hawk here. Try and keep trying. James, you are always winning. And James says, is a duck chanting goshawk. Very well done, correct, James. Is a duck chanting goshawk. Excellent. And the, another similar goshawk to this one will be the eastern uh, pale chanting, eastern pale chanting goshawk. But apparently it's very difficult to see them overlapping. Areas that you'll see the duck chanting goshawks, you will not see the pale or the eastern pale chanting goshawk. James, very well done. Me and Manu here give you some five. Very good. Let's go to the sleepy Tingana and find out what Tristan will tell us. Well, yes, I suppose Sleepy, not so much at the moment. He's doing his very best, I'm trying to hide impression. So he's getting himself into as thick a little area as possible in order to stop the baboons from seeing him. The baboons are still hanging around and I'm actually quite surprised that they haven't seen Tingana this morning because the angle that they're at, unfortunately we can't show you because of the roof and, and how we positioned at the moment, but the angle that they're at, they're quite high up in a tall tambuetti and the ability for them to see him i thought would have been there i thought they might have been able to especially his back end sticking out like that that they would have seen the spots but seems as though maybe he is kind of well hidden from where they are or they just haven't really looked in this direction um, but they are milling about very close to where he is and eventually i think they might start drifting across the dam wall they've kind of been slowly edging along um, and so we'll just have to wait and see. Maybe we're going to end up with them kind of coming this way, in which case it will be very interesting to see the reaction. I'm not sure if you can hear them in the background. They're making quite a bit of a racket, particularly the young ones. They've been full of beans this morning. TT, do the baboons try to jump on our car with the roof? I can honestly say no. Um, that has never happened and the reason for that is primarily because the baboons don't really they're not very relaxed in this area when it comes to vehicles so when they see vehicles they generally are a little bit more kind of wary and they'll sort of stay away and that's probably because there's not a huge percentage of vehicles that drives past them um, and so this big moving noisy object they rather keep their distance um, and so we don't actually get baboons coming too close to us at all and therefore not jumping on the roof. I think if they were far more relaxed like the 
the baboons in Kruger that see vehicles all the time and people unfortunately feed them which is something you must not do if you go to any national parks do not feed animals it's not good for them to be feeding them some of the things we eat um, but they get very relaxed there and then they jump on the cars and all kinds of things so they would probably do it with ours but it's not a safe thing either to have baboons jumping around on your car everyone always thinks oh you know it's not that bad a baboon can be seriously dangerous and a bite from one of those is no joke um, a big male baboon if that gets hold of you you're going to be in bad shape you're going to have a lot of massive lacerations from their, their jaws also bacterial infections and all kinds of other things so best not to mess around with baboons and I'm quite glad that they don't see our car as something that they can jump on and play on because it would be a tricky thing to try and kind of keep them away from it and, and certainly you'd end up probably having a few, bit of a sort of issue with it and once one learns it's very difficult to stop the rest so no they don't jump on the cars and we like it that way um, try and discourage baboons from even jumping on houses and the roofs and try and kind of keep them out of our living spaces because they are not nice neighbors if you want to call it that they are very destructive and incredibly powerful people don't think baboons are as strong as they are um, we have aluminium sliding doors um, at the various parts of, of where we stay um, at Inga's and they bend those aluminium doors completely so they bend them open um, and to the point where they even break the glass sometimes um, and are able to then get in and um, cause all kinds of havoc so they, they are can be a bit of a handful um, and it's generally in the winter months. You find in summer months not too bad because there's enough food for them. But in winter they, they can be a bit tricky because there's very little food. And then they, you know, they see through a window, they see a whole bunch of food items. It's no wonder in desperation that they break through things. But try and just discourage them from being there and kind of chase them away when they're around. And generally then they start to learn that this is not a safe place to go and forage for food. But, I mean, they haven't been around much the last week. Uh, they were here a lot when I got back from leave, and then they disappeared for a week. And this is what this troop does. Is it's the same troop that comes around. They do a, they've got a nice little kind of loop that they go through. They go from sort of this area, and then they head all the way south down towards Little Gari. And then they mess around at Little Gari and Chitwa and Annette, and then they come back again. It's like a little loop that they go through. So, you know, Vessel's Camp, Hoffman's Camp, those are private places but they go and cause havoc down there and then they come back up to Juma and cause a bit of trouble here and then when they get chased away from here then they go back and it's kind of this loop effect that happens with these guys um, it's seriously intelligent though and it's one thing about baboons is that you've got to give them credence for their intelligence and their ability to figure things out and how they actually go about getting into houses and various other things in fact in Cape Town they even know how to open car doors, which is quite something. So they've figured out that people don't lock their doors at certain tourist spots, and then they'll uh, open the doors and kind of steal fruit and food and various other things. Right, Craig, we have a whole bunch of Nyala that are walking our way too, which is going to be quite interesting. I'm not sure if you'll be able to get them, but they are slowly coming through the drainage line. It's a whole bunch of males um, that are walking down. Now, as much as Tingana does have a meal and obviously he in no way needs to hunt anything, if an opportunity presents itself and Nyala get too close, he can most certainly will go after them. And it's only because of sort of, what's the word for it, instinct, um, that he'll try and kind of hunt these things. So it'll be interesting to see if the Nyala do come this way. Tingana is definitely watching both the Nyalas and the baboons with a keen sort of look about him. Um, the Nyalas are still a long way away though. It's probably a good, I'd say 60 meters from where we are currently. Um, and they would have to come a lot closer before he would attempt it. If he was hungry, different story, but if he's full like this, it's more an opportunistic thing that the Nyala walks right near him and then he grabs it. Uh, I would love to be able to tell you, um, I, we can't see the kill very well at all. All I can see is fluff and fur inside the bush. It's right here in front of me. So in this bush over here, inside there is where the kill is. Um, and you can't really, as you can see by that, is you can't see much. Um, so just in between those branches, even for the camera it's a bit tricky, I can see a few bits of fur. Um, so I'm not sure how much he's eaten, if I'm honest with you. But judging by his tummy, he's got quite a full round rotund tummy. So I, I suspect 
that he's eaten a fair amount. Now, I, I would like to know from you guys. Yesterday morning, he was spotted on the dam cam you know, before we found him and before he made this kill. And was he full or was he very, very skinny at that point? Because it would be interesting to know if he was full prior to killing this. And that would then explain if he hasn't eaten too much of this and um, why he hasn't eaten too much of it. Um, but it'll be interesting. I don't mean, like I said, I don't know how much has been consumed. It doesn't look like he's eaten all that much, if I'm honest. And the nice thing for him is that this carcass is going to stay nice and fresh. It's not going to smell too much, and the meat itself is not going to be all that kind of rotten because of how cool it's been in the rain that's around. There's no hot sun like two days ago, which would have made that carcass stinky and smelly and rotten. Right, so we're going to be patient and hope that the baboons and yalas and impalas and all kinds of other things that are billing about start heading in our direction. In the meantime, back up to David who's on a birding morning and has another feathered friend in a tree. Well, the baboons that Tristan have are very different from the baboons that we have in Kenya because those are the chakma baboons and in Kenya we got different species of baboons we got two types we got the olive baboons and the yellow baboons and also here in the Mara we only got the olive baboons now I was dealing with the duck chanting Gosho Kalia but now I got another bird of prey here I will not want to ask you the question or ask you who she is because I'm sure you all know that this is the black chested snake eagle. I initially thought, wow, a martial eagle, how exciting is this? And I thought, wow, it'll be my big trophy for the day. Then on a closer look, oh, is black chested snake eagle. From a distance, you can easily mix them up. But comparing to the duck chanting go shock that we just saw a few minutes ago, you know, they tend to patch almost like 90 degrees from where they are. But again, both of them, this one and the duck chanting goshawk are on a tortured tree and definitely getting the very top part, uh, patching at the highest point. Of course, that gives you the advantage or the advantage of being able to spot whatever they'll be looking at. And if you compare the sites of uh, snake eagles and martial eagles, I would respect the snake eagles. They got wonderful, wonderful vision. And I just confirmed a friend of mine who's an expert of eagles, and he told me seeing two, three miles is possible for the snake eagles. And you'd see her just leaving where she is, flying down a mile or two, getting to the ground and picking herself a snake. I've seen that once, that's way back in a national park in Kenya called Amboseli. But that was a, a brown snake eagle and we happened just to drive along the road and we were parallel with that uh, snake eagle. And after about a mile or so, we saw her coming down and what she picked up was a uh, black mamba. And I thought, how you know, would it see it? But yeah, we have known with time that's, that's very possible. Very patient egos, they're never in a rush. And one big difference between these egos and the other egos is they do not got uh, booted tarsis. If you look on their feet, all the way up to the elbows or the legs, I mean their knees, they do not have as much feathers. Or basically they don't have feathers, snake egos, unlike the martial egos or the crowned egos. One big common they have all these egos is the yellow eyes and very hooked beaks to be able to tear meat. In general, you see them solitary as she is or he is, and very unusual to see them in use. But it's not where we we'll see that. Of course, if they would be mating, the duck chanting gosh hawk, we just saw I have been two on that particular tree but I think one might have gone to the market today. I'm not surprised to see this one here on her own. Well, hopefully, preening herself, just to make sure 
when the opportunity comes. You see, she keeps turning her head, and any slight movement, either close to where she is or further down or further up, she'll pick or she'll confirm a sighting. Just like us, how we go looking for animals and then we confirm sightings and we let our friends know. So once she confirms a sighting for herself, she'll go for it. This small good question, and you'd like to know why they call it a black-chested snake. You go, while the chest is white. Now, it's only that this small, she is looking a different direction. Not sure what I would do to make her turn, but this will give me a couple of seconds because I'm going to show you uh, something on my book of birds, and I might help to explain to you why they would call it black chested snake eagle so give me a couple of seconds i think i have the wrong or the right book okay hold on right there man thank you very much for making sure this more will be able to understand why we call it that and 3440 okay now, this one, I hope you're still there, and I'll be able to explain to you why we call her the black-chested uh, snake eagle. And Manu, let me know when you can, and you'll be coming to tell me the best, and go. How is that? Now, this more I hope you're still watching, and Manu wants us to go to number three there. Most of the ones on top, uh, snake eagles and in general they all got yellow eyes but this one if you look carefully there on top of the breast right there that's all black see that this one very good so the breast is basically white but on top of the breast this is what they call the chest and birders or the taxonomists thank you man that's exactly what i want this one to see so if you look carefully there this one that bit from the neck downwards towards the chest is all black and that's why they call it the black chested snake eagle very good and some of how they have been able to identify these birds whereas me for example we got black kites when you see black kites this small black kites are brown they're not black there's certain other smaller birds around here that are called uh, clothes. And these small birds, and you get, they give them such long names. And if I see one, I'll be showing you. And they call it like the yellow throated long claw for these birds. But you know, we take those names, those names. Well, let me head down to my destination of the Sausage Republic, and I think only want to talk about arachnids. People have been lucky this morning, but I'm not lucky yet. I left the hyena den. Um, I'm in search of uh, Tandi, but I can't find any evidence of where she might be. No tracks, and it's still raining. It, we can see this spider web. It's so beautiful. I stopped here because last night I was uh, studying a little bit more about the the spiders and uh, how they they produce their webs it's so interesting and what we see here you see this gap it has uh, like there's there's no pattern there there's only few webs there that space you can see around there it's called a free zone Spiders do that on, on purpose. And then you see this middle circle there, which is actually let me go out and 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 then show you how how this thing is. Uh, 
Spider spilled this thing on purpose. What I was, I was telling you was about was this part. This is called a free zone. And then this small thing you see over here, this web, this round web, it's called a hub. And then the whole part, it's called a, a, a catch, catching uh, web. And then the, the outer part of the, of the spider web or the frame is called the bridge line because that's where the spider starts to build when they're creating this web. And then we also have uh, in the middle here, there's this web uh, that runs from here straight in the middle until they, that's called the foundation line. Interesting, hey? Oh, spiders. And not forgetting the radials, those are, there's, parts that hangs on to the frame of this spider web. Ooh, it's nice. Sip? Yeah. Let's hit the road and go and look for Tandy. Oh, amazing. Something I've... It's, it's a, how they produce web and spiders have silk as you know they produce silk but not all the spiders produce webs oh we're losing a signal I must go stationary FC just said that am I good FC Oh, so I'm stationary. I'm trying to get my signal right. Let's go to Tristan with Tingana. Gotta, gonna wow them. Well, not much is happening outside either. We had obviously luck with Tingi, but we haven't really kind of had too many developments other than that the baboon, baboons have seen him, or well, some of at least, and have shouted at him a little bit and kind of made a bit of a fuss, but no one's really done anything. Tingana doesn't seem to be too stressed. As you can see, he's made himself a lot more comfy and is now on his side rather than being on his haunches. And the rain is starting to fall and the baboons well they're fairly quiet at this stage now i'm going to show you where the baboons are because they might bark at some point so they're just going to have to turn the car just a little bit for craig so let's just turn upwards so we should be able to see one of the big males straight through there if i turn the car like that then craig should have a view of them on the branch Kind of across the way from us so that's where they are at the moment now those baboons there you go you can hear them shouting i'll keep quiet for a little bit now of course i'm keeping quiet they're not going to shout are they but let's see when this male gets a bit higher if he's going to be the one that makes a loud barking sound. Now, I often say that baboons are alarm calling and I'm sure a lot of you have probably not heard it. Let's see if he'll shout now. You see he's got himself up. You can also see the rain that's starting to fall now. Big yawn. Now look at the size of the teeth when he yawns. There we go. Amazing, isn't it? Serious, serious teeth that these guys have got. It's no joke the size of their canines and it's why, like I say, that they can be so dangerous even to something like a leopard. Now I'm hoping that bull, that uh, not bull, I don't know why I said bull, but I'm hoping that... There we go. Did you hear him? Let's see if he'll shout again. Big yawn, he's, he's Mr. Harry Casual about the fact that there's a leopard. <laughs> now at this stage, I suppose they're fairly happy with the status quo and how it kind of is at the moment. Um, they are not too kind of 
stressed by the fact that Tingana is sort of sitting and not moving around. I think that's part of the reason why they haven't come down and challenged him in any way. Um, they know that he doesn't have to worry too much about his kind of movement. Tingana is just lying there, and so wouldn't be surprised what they do is start to come down and start to move off. But baboon's going to take up residence there and you'll find all the little ones it was amazing it was one baboon that went up this tree and shouted and every single baboon that was on the ground went straight up into the trees um, immediately to all look around and then a whole lot of them started to actually alarm call there you can see one of the younger ones is mimicking dad or at least one of the older males remember in a baboon troop it's not just one dominant male within the group there's going to be a whole bunch of males that are constantly vying for their dominance and for the right to be mating with females so there'll be a number of big males within a grouping and so even if they do lose the the so-called dominant individual um, they will be able to replace that quite quickly with with another male that will come in but you can see how everybody is moving now so they've decided time to leave the area it's also because a vehicle is coming in to see Tingana which means we're gonna to have to reposition ourselves as well Janet's a firm so a baboon's canine is longer um, than what you see from a leopard so leopard's canine while it is still impressive is not quite the same length as what you see from something like a baboon now i'm going to stop here it's not ideal for me because i'm going to have to duck my head down because of where he is but it's going to be for the other vehicle that's arriving they can at least position themselves now um, behind us and still be able to see tingana you can see tingana unfortunately has not woken up i was really hoping that he was going to wake up and decide to start moving around with those baboons sort of shouting at him or even go towards his carcass but alas the old duke is well doing what dukes do and i suppose sleep with a full belly on a rainy day can't say i blame him it's the right weather to be asleep I, craig was at the back here was telling me he'd rather have been in bed this morning mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not very very pleasant weather to be out and about so i'm not surprised he's made a little nest for himself to have a good sleep carol so yes baboons will be territorial in that they will um, have a well I suppose not territorial it's probably not the right word for it um, they have a home range and they will if they come across other baboons fight with them so they, it's more that I suppose territory is a bit of a sort of stretch for them they they do have an area that they will utilize um, and they are they do have competition from others and if they come across one another there is often fights that um, break out um, but they're not as territorial as something like a leopard or a or a lion that will actively go and mark an area out um, they are more kind of animals that will move around according to food availability so when they need food they'll start to try and find it um, and they might then push out of a certain core area and deep into a home range of maybe another set of baboons and then there'll be a bit of a tussle as to who gets the right for that water and, and food availability so it depends on on the animals uh, well I mean on the conditions but generally they are not actively um, patrolling a territory and scent marking and those kind of things um, it's more home range if you want to call it that um, but there will be territorial males within it who are going to try and dominate in order to have mating rights and be sort of in charge of the troop i'm just trying to see if this vehicle's got enough space it looks like they do to be able to see us now tingy's at least put up his head for two seconds and then popped it back down again so still sleeping at this stage hopefully he will wake up at some point and decide to start moving i'm really surprised though that he hasn't actually we haven't seen him feed at all so the three hours we spent here yesterday and so far this morning there's been no feeding taking place at all and i would have thought at some point we would have seen him at least just kind of mouth it or drag it a little bit or have a bit of a, a sort of chew on it but suppose he's happy with where he is right well we're going to spend a little bit more time here we'll see what's going to play out with the baboon still shouting at him and see whether or not they'll he'll move around in the meantime back up to david in the morrow well you yeah, i mean tristan don't leave uh, tingana just stay right there 
and see whether we see an action like what we had last night uh, in the Mara with the lions. As I said earlier, and I'm sure Tristan must have said, the baboons and leopards have never been friends. I'm just going back to all the scenario, all the happenings of the lions yesterday with Pat and looking at the feelings or the views of the viewers that they think that some of the sub-adult males would have committed the crimes or would have, not crimes per se, because that's the way of the lions, would have killed uh, the two or three cubs yesterday. And as I said, we got uh, more questions than answers. And I'm looking at if it were those sub-adults, those sub-adult males were fathered by the three Kichwa males, Fan, the half-tail, and the other male. So why would they, you know, kill uh, the cubs of the same uh, lineage? It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And that's, that's number one. Number two, I do not know how far the males were, you know, uh, half-tail and fang, not to come in on time to make sure that does not happen. Because every time I watch that footage again and again, I saw the two fully grown males trying to keep calm and, you know, stop it. But I'm having a slight, you know, school of thought that actually the bigger problem yesterday was between the females. As much as we may call it infanticide, as we are going to maybe unravel that later today or tomorrow or the next coming uh, few days, I think there was a very bad blood between the two prides there, the Marsh Pride and the Olololos. And I can only think uh, the bad blood was brought by competition of resources. I do not see any other reason. I mean, the Mara Triangle is huge. There's enough room for everybody. And as yesterday, they had that hippo kill. And being the greenish season now, being very quiet in terms of the amount of prey that is available, chances are reduce the numbers and then you know of our own we'll have enough to eat otherwise as yet i'm not pointing any finger to those uh pride males of the ololos the marsh pride and the, Mar the marsh breakaways and the mara river pride those three males have always been in charge but should we have seen new males coming in for example scarface uh with his you know three brothers or maybe the old on your pike male uh the two nomadic males that you have been seeing then you would say definitely this is a very classical example of infanticide kicho boys fought out and the new coalition would be taking over and that's exactly what they do bring down the cabs females a week or so in Istras start meeting and have their own generation. I really would want to follow that story and know exactly the ins and outs of it. Otherwise, I love the sausages, but I'm sure either Patrick or Lauren will be giving us more info, maybe what they find out uh, this afternoon. I'm currently in the very heart of the Sausage Republic and I'll first start going where I left them yesterday. Agents, you're asking Agents, you're asking if Kichwa males would know their cubs during a battle. I would say absolutely, absolutely. I mean, animals are clever and there's that internal connection you know between them and their cubs so edges i would tell you for a fact i would want to believe that the kitchen males would definitely tell the cubs they mated with the females 
they have seen them born, they have seen them grow. We have not seen, I do not remember, I could be wrong here, I haven't heard or seen of where uh, a male lion killed its own cubs ages. So I would want to say the Kichwa males would definitely uh, tell their own cubs. And that's why I'm not sure ages you're watching yesterday on a number of occasions when the fights or when the fight between the females was getting very intense. You see the males coming in and just rolling. I'm not sure you've seen how congressmen or how people behave in parliament and when people are or become unruly the speakers will all the speaker will always go order 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 so from what i saw uh the kichwa male doing they kept saying order 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 and every time they would turn up and go like that and just roll her, you'd notice immediately things would just calm down so i would say definitely they will know their own cubs So I was saying earlier, I'll start going from where I left the sausages yesterday. And sausages are the lions, are part of lions that live here. They've been known to have to climb trees, and in particular, a type of tree that we call sausage. It bears fruit that takes the shapes of sausage. That's why we call it a sausage tree, and they've been known to climb it there. I mean, that's how we name our characters that's how we name our lions our cheetahs our leopards just because of maybe their behavior what they do or sometimes what they look like either from ids in that particular pride we have one female that we call the king tail who got a bent tail very very good now i'll start by going there and then see what happens tristan do you want to tell us anything about tingana well yeah, i suppose we do know one or two things about him spent a long time following tingi it's been many years now kind of watching him as he's gone along and it's impressive to see how long he's held tenure as a, a dominant male it's a lot longer than most people would think you know a lot of the time people would be read books and it would say male leopard will be dominant for you know anywhere between sort of four and five years and tingy's pushing towards eight now or seven seven years is probably about as the time that he's been proper dominant male um but that is a very long time and he doesn't look like he's slowing down i mean he's looking is pretty good um he's certainly not as active in terms of vocalizing and scenting in this particular part of the world at this stage i think that might change though if he potentially mates with tandy or he's mating with any sort of female and they start to have cubs in this area i think his ability to vocalize and sort of scent mark and patrol will be far more if uh, he has something to protect, you know, in the form of Clalamba these days, she's much older, so he doesn't really have too many cubs around, and, and therefore maybe vocalizing in this particular section just isn't a priority. Maybe he's doing a lot of vocalizing and marking up into Bufalzook and Tortured. Um, we don't know. Um, obviously, we don't see him much on those sort of areas, and so not 100% sure what his behavior is there, but it's been amazing to kind of see how well he's done. I mean, he's, as much as some people dislike Tingana, for um for his uh, sort of killing traits that he's shown once or twice and he for me has been an example of just how successful a male leopard can be um long tenure and, and has fathered a number of cubs um obviously a lot haven't made it but he's he has fathered quite a few so really really good to see our old boy doing well now of course you will be hearing the baboons shouting in the background they still can kind of see him and still shouting at him he doesn't seem too perturbed by it and it's been a bit of a non-event if i'm honest i would have thought the baboons would have been a lot more kind of irritated by his presence but i suppose the fact that he's not moving and just lying here is maybe why they haven't been nearly as sort of panicked by the fact that there is a leopard around um generally baboons get quite bent out of shape with leopards but this lot seems to to be kind of 
all right with the fact that he's just lying there. It is starting to rain a lot heavier now. It's become fairly miserable actually out here at the moment. So I'm not surprised everyone's just staying in their own place. Kelly and Baboon's eyesight's very good. So they have eyes on the front of their, their head, much like us. So binocular vision, which means their depth perception is very, very good. And just like you or I, if we go up into a tree, our field of view is quite far. I mean, we can see movement from a long way away. Um, and so baboons and, and vervet monkeys have very, very keen eyesight. And it's often why we struggle to find predators when baboons or vervets alarm call. Um, it's purely because they often can see them remember that they generally are much higher than what we are so they climb trees and they can get a sort of very different point of view um, and they can see far and so sometimes you'll find boons will be alarm calling here but they're actually seeing let's say hypothetically a leopard on quarantine um, and we kind of looking around where the baboons are and we don't find anything and that's and that's the reason why is that they see a long long way so the eyesight is very very good um, if you think like I say you go up onto a tall tree and have a look at how far you can see and how far you can notice movement you'll figure out very quickly that it's it's a long long way um, and so their eyesight is very good uh, and you know I was surprised this morning that it took them as long as it did to actually spot him and there must have been something in the way at first because as soon as they went up a tree with a different angle they saw him immediately and they started to kind of shout and, and make a bit of a noise but their eyesight is fantastically well fantastic really I suppose this is probably the best way to describe it Elisa, do baboons and vervets get along? Well, the thing is with baboons is they're so much larger, so vervets generally just give away um, to the baboons. Um, and and the thing is with them, even if baboons hypothetically were going to hunt them, you know, vervets are, are smaller, lighter, more nimble, and so the chances of a baboon catching a vervet unawares is probably quite slim. Um, but yes, they. I mean, I've seen them both in the same tree and moving around and kind of not really worrying about each other too much. Um, but the, the vervets definitely have a respect for the baboons and, and will give way when the baboons move. So let's say there's a food source and a vervet's there. The, the baboons coming up that tree, the vervet will kind of go higher up and then sort of jump off into the next tree or kind of just stay right up in the tops of the branches and wait for the baboons to be finished. They won't challenge them for a food item. Um, they know the baboons are far stronger and, and bigger, but you do see them in the same spaces fairly regularly and there's not too much in the way of competition or um, or any sort of aggression, really. Uh, I think it's always a, a situational thing, though, you know. Um, baboons are an animal that are going to do whatever it takes to survive and I would imagine if you get into periods where you have drought then vervet monkeys would potentially be a food item um, then baboons might be far more aggressive towards them and, and try and grab them um, baboons are like that they sometimes will be very 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 chilled around animals and then you know they start to get hungry and there's less food around and then they become difficult and a prime example of that is up in the Zambezi Valley and low Zambezi is that it gets very dry there um, towards the sort of end of the dry season and, and very little food and you'll find then the baboons actually become the sort of I don't want to say apex predator but they certainly become one of the, the bigger predators um, out there in fact they they probably hunt just as much as if you a lion or a leopard and they'll go after warthogs and impalas and dike and steambok all these kind of antelope species that you get um, even baby kudus and, um, squirrels pretty much scrub hares they go after all of those things and, and they will hunt them regularly so I'd imagine if they become desperate then a vervet monkey would be something that they might try and hunt and, and try and grab um, but it'll be a difficult animal to catch a vervet monkey is feet of foot and is good at climbing and moving around just as much as a baboon is so it would be a hard prey to go after. But so far we've seen no fleet footedness at all from pretty much anybody really. Baboons have been certainly taking it very easy, Tingan has been taking it easy, no one's really kind of made a move to be honest um, and so at this stage we just kind of in limbo. Um, I was hoping, like I say, that Tingana would wake up with the baboon, but he just seems to be completely relaxed at this stage and really doesn't seem to want to move at all. Can't say I blame him, to be honest. I would be the same, I think, if I had a meal and horrible weather. I'd also be lounging about in the grass.
Good, so we're going to reposition, try to see if we can get a slightly better view than what we've got of his body and his belly. Um, and while we do that, let's send you back across to Molly, who's still searching for Tandy in this dreary weather. Oh, nothing yet. What I can find is only the bushes. Ah. I haven't seen any animal activity ah, because of this rain. But now I'm on my way to to Dam. I'm driving on the eastern part of the reserve. I'm searching, I'm searching, I'm searching. We'll find that's Tandy. I have to go stationary again. FC said so. Oh, so, you know, the cats, more especially lions and leopards, they walk vast distances in this kind of the weather. So, we had the, the, an update of the Inkuhumas, our pride of lions. They went south to our neighboring reserve. So, we are not lucky with them, but now we'll go to Bethelsuk. Hopefully we'll find Scuba Steve because we saw a lot of his footprints here. I've never seen Scuba Steve outside of the water, but for now, let's go to Tristan. Right, Oli, if you could see Scuba Steve could be exciting. Uh, we, we, we also got hippos in the Mara, which we you know, rarely see unless your golf course is very close to the Mara River. It would be exciting if you get him out. And more often than not, I remember I kept seeing him in the water. Now, we just stopped here at a vantage point and we got our far lookers out just to scan the area. And what you can see are just elephants in the beautiful Mara Triangle. And you can see the openness of the grass. And this is one major difference in terms of vegetation between the Mara and Kruger National Park, or in particular Juma, that here you could comfortably see for a couple of kilometers or a couple of miles straight without what I call visual pollution. The only visual pollution you see will be this uh, torch wood trees, which are very iconic of the Mara. And we're trying to do is to look for my favorite uh, pride of lions. That one particular tree you see there that's broken that uh, Manu is showing you, Manu is the camera operator with me this morning, is where we left them yesterday. Now, they went there after they had a drink and we had the most exciting uh, sighting yesterday, seeing about 12, 13 uh, lions with cubs of different ages having a drink in a pan of water. It was just wonderful, right? Is there something walking there? Which side of that tree? At the bottom of it. So I also going to pause for a second and look. Are you seeing one of the tree, Manu? Yeah. So, and I'm going to look at the same tree because if that's the case, what Manu seems correct, we might have to go back to that tree. Do you see the top on the right, Manu? Looking towards that tree? Any movement on that tree, I would say it must be those lions. That's where we left them yesterday. That tree, we give it a name and we call it the sausage, I'm mean, not the sausage tree, the giraffe tree because it takes the shape of a, of a giraffe. And they remained there because they had just had a drink and having pretty small cubs. Yeah. You think so? So we might be heading that particular direction. And I thought because they had small cubs, they would have moved to go to look for a different area. And yeah, if you look carefully there, it's quite difficult to see. Let me look again. But I can also see slight movement with my Stravonskis. And if that is the case, then it would mean they did not leave that spot. Okay. 
and there's a topi to the right if you look carefully and that topi is so glued towards that tree she is not getting her eyes out of that tree and chances are they could have remained there you remember a couple of days ago they brought down a huge uh, male buffalo and if they did that they would go two three you know maybe four days without making another kill all that because they know they have cubs they need to keep uh, you know eating especially the females and also king tail who got the smallest or the youngest cubs so what we want to do is just turn around and go to that tree i give it a pass earlier not thinking you know they could be there and trying to go in the thickets because still a rather cold uh was maybe guessing they could be still there trying to hold their cubs before it gets warm for them to come out but what i want to do get a place Turn around and go to that tree that I told you I call it the giraffe tree because of the shape it takes of a giraffe. Is that a Maasai giraffe maybe? But a giraffe is a giraffe. So and we get a place here to turn and go right there. And most likely they did not move. They must have spent the night there. That was yesterday morning, like now it's 24 hours ago. And I'll not be surprised if they're still there which is rather unusual. It was uh, more of an open area in terms of having cubs. I'm talking about the weather. You know, it could have been a bit chilly for the cubs. Kingtail got the youngest. I'm sure you saw them yesterday, for those who were watching. She got three very teeny, teeny, uh, small cubbies. So let's go there. Cross fingers. Could be them. And if not them, we're here for a long time to try and get them. All right, I got a plan now. Let's all cross fingers. Hopefully we'll be seeing your favorite cubbies. And let me take you back to Juma, to Tristan with Tingana. Well, good luck. I hope that you find them, David, given that you had to drive a long way down to where the sausages are. Hopefully you'll be lucky and find what's going on. Anyway, we've moved slightly and you can see we get a much better view of Tingina, who's still being shouted at and being moaned at and complained at by the various baboons that are around. And he's very unperturbed by the fact that they're shouting at him and he's just lying in the rain, really, which is pretty much how it's been for the last few days. Are they shouting at you, boy? Are they ruining your sleep today? Doesn't seem too concerned, does he? He's almost just rolled over and had a nice kind of bed that he's made for himself there. He's got a thicket of grass that he's lay in and it's amazing how many areas you can see where he slept during the course of the night. There's all these little patches that have been flattened where Tingana is had himself a really good nap at some point. Now, the carcass had a quick look when we tried to reposition. I can see it a little bit. Craig won't be able to see it where he is. Um, but he has, by the looks of things, eaten quite a bit off the back end. It was a fairly new kudu, uh, or baby kudu, that he grabbed. Um, so there's probably about half, I would say, maybe three quarters of it left. Um, so still quite a bit that he's got and will be able to kind of feed on. But certainly isn't making life easy, that's for sure. He's kind of being on the tad on the sleepy side which has really not allowed us too much in the way of very decent views of Tingana. It's a tricky spot as well. It's um, He's kind of lying in a dense area and it's not really conducive to seeing pretty kind of views of him that's for sure. Gizmo, can big cats like this one get food poisoning? Um, well, naturally, no, not really. Um, they have a very strong constitution. They survive it. Um, but what I will say is that they can potentially get um, a lot of worms and things like that that can affect their overall condition, which then may lead to them struggling to hunt a little bit. 
Um, but food poisoning, not so much. They can be poisoned via food, though. So people do often poison cats, unfortunately, by using well, using food as, as a bait and then adding lacing it with poison, um, which is a very indiscriminate way to kill anything because there's so many by kind of, I suppose by catch is not the right word, but there's so many other animals that are hugely affected when people do those kind of things. It's It's terrible when people poison carcasses because birds and insects and mammals of various descriptions will, will be we affected by that um, but from natural food sources very 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 seldom will you see them eat something and, and get ill from it um, I certainly haven't seen that really take place um, in the wild and I've seen leopards and lions eat some pretty disgusting things um, I've once seen lions eating a giraffe in the sand river where the giraffe had turned to a green coloration and was starting to become liquid it was sort of liquefying and dripping and they were still eating it so and they were absolutely fine um, so they have strong abilities to digest yes calm down baboons let's see there's a leopard everything will be okay good anyway the baboons are screaming and shouting and doing their thing Tingan is still sleeping but Molly has finally had a little bit of success and found himself a bird Oh yes, I found something, a bird. <laughs> I was on my way to Baffles Hook Dam, and then I, f I, found, I, I saw this bird, which is a Franklin. So I'm trying to figure out which Franklin is this, because it has the yellow legs, and it's wet. What happened was, it just came out, out from the grasses there, and it, came straight to a road and I nearly walked on top of it. I thought it was going to fly, but nothing. It, it couldn't. I think it's, it's too wet to fly. But I doubt because uh, birds, they have this special gland that they produce and then they, it turns into oil and then they become uh, waterproofed hello Betty have you seen a leopard this morning ah nothing how can I look for a leopard oh sorry it's feeling cold I wish I can offer this bird some blanket here or some clothing but it's a no-no. This is one of the traffics you can find here in the bush. So I'll press forward and see what I will find there in the bush. And don't forget, Seb is the one who's giving you all these wonderful pictures behind the camera. Ooh. It just ran. It, it didn't fly. I think it can. I, it can't fly. It's not only difficult for us during this weather and some other species like birds, if it rains a lot, they struggle. So I left my bird heading straight to Pefasuk Dam. But for now, let's go to Tristan with his rosette cat. Well, well done. At least you've started on the scoreboard. Hopefully there'll be something in wait at Bilfuzuk Dam, maybe little Klalamba hanging around somewhere in that area. Although I would suspect that little Klalamba maybe, maybe, maybe is taking it very easy and trying to kind of hide out from this horrible weather that we're having and also much like Tingana is sitting in a thicket resting but hopefully she's around the dam and, and we'll be able to kind of see her and figure out what she's been up to it would be nice to kind of see her again this morning I would imagine I'm sure Ollie would be happy to see her as well I'm still impressed at the size of the impala that she managed to bring down very very cool that she managed to get such a big meal Beverly, it's a bit of a difficult question um, in that 
every day is different for a leopard um, and some days they're going to sleep a lot more and others not um, but generally if we if we think about it there's at least probably in a 24 hour period they're going to be sleeping sort of 10 to 15 hours um, at least uh, that's kind of on a sort of average day obviously some days maybe potentially hunting conditions are better and they try and move around a lot more um, or there's days like this where Tingana's got a big meal he doesn't have to go anywhere the conditions are are right for him to just lie wherever he wants to and, and rest and therefore he'll probably sleep a lot more he'll probably sleep closer towards sort of 20 hours during the course of this 24 hour period so it just depends it's always variable with them um, a leopard is not quite like lions that in I find that they tend to move a lot more than lions um, and tend to be a lot more active at random times of the day this whole notion that a leopard is only nocturnal strictly nocturnal is, is obviously we've been disproven many times by the fact that we often find leopards walking around at 12 o'clock in the day um, here in the Sabi Sands and even hunting during the day and this is a case in point Tingana made this kill I think at about 10 o'clock yesterday morning half past nine 10 o'clock somewhere there um, in the morning which and it was you know a lot warmer um, and so you wouldn't expect him to be moving around at that time of the day but obviously opportunity is, is something that a leopard thrives on and, and will take um, and so you know they are active whenever they need to be active I, I mean I have seen also lions moving around but it's interesting to see tend to see kind of the lions in the Mara a lot more active during the day than the lions here our lines here tend to move around a lot sort of at dawn and dusk and then just into the night and, and just before the sun rises um, but you don't see them too much during the day moving around it does happen every now and then but it's not like the Mara the Mara lions tend to tend to be fairly active during the day I mean I've had many many occasions where following lions in the Mara and uh, you know 12 o'clock in the day they're actively hunting even on a warm day um, so it just seems as though there's different kind of methods um, I'm not sure why that is it's not like the lions in the Mara don't have opportunity to find food at night and certainly don't camouflage very well it's just, it's just for some reason they've worked out maybe it's because of the prey animals that they're targeting a lot of the Mara lions targets warthogs and warthogs obviously aren't around um, at night they tend to hide away and so maybe that's why they actively look for warthogs during those hot parts of the day to be able to find them could be part of it obviously the lions of the Mara are a topic today and, and last night given what took place and I honestly haven't seen any of what happened I just heard about it from various people but I'll go and have a little look and see it sounds quite disturbing though to watch and certainly a confusing sighting by the sounds of things good so now it seems as though Molly has arrived at Bufuzuk Dam and therefore there is the star of the show and star of the season, the most exciting hippo in the world. So let's go have a look at what Scuba Steve is up to now. Yes, indeed, Tristan, I'm here with Scuba Steve and his girlfriend. I thought he was dumped, but nah. It simply means they had a conflict and then Snuckle Sarah left, so she's back on track. They have resolved uh, their issues. They are now good. So, uh, Seb, can you see that island there? That's popping out there. And that island is breaking my heart today. That island is really breaking my heart because uh, that one just right next to, see that uh, hippo? That hippo, there's an island just right next to that hippo. Something like it's popping out, out there. It's breaking my heart because it simply means this dam is drying up. Oh, shame on you, Scuba Steve. And you can see all the vegetation that's growing in here. I don't know whether you'll, you'll get this because of the, of the roof. Uh, so we can't go there, but there's vegetation growing there. You can see where they are growing. It simply means it's drying. Hopefully we're going to have a lot and a lot of rain so that this dam doesn't dry up so that we can have Scuba Steve anytime we like. Mm, 
What a nice and quiet morning. Still drizzling. And before we went live, I had one of the hippo going like, mm. and that's the sound I've never had live. It was my first time hearing a hippo making such a sound. I've heard that hippos, they've been known to make sounds underneath the water. So this is what I've heard. So I'm still in search of Tandy. So, but now I've decided that maybe she will be searching for us and show herself to us because I've searched all over the place from uh, south side to the east side. But I won't give up. I will go to the west and check whether I'll find something there. Maybe I'll bump to Okumuri, our male leopard. Uh, I'm not here to stay, Scuba Steve. Let me love and leave you. But for now, while I'm doing that, let's go up to the Mara and see the little ones. Very well done, uh, Oli and Yobia. We decided to come and look what we saw from about two miles away. And truly, what we saw was correct. We saw some little sticks jumping up and down from a distance. And look at that face. Look who's sneaking, looking with those shy eyes there. And I'm thinking those could be kinktails, lioness cubs. And how nice to see these cubbies here and interesting they're in the same spot i left them yesterday which initially i doubted and i was wrong i guessed they might have only come here to keep cool because by the time we were leaving them it was getting warm and they would have gone maybe later on when to cool down to their usual bedding place in a particular lager or some sort of valley for the night now i've seen seven cubs here in total we got those three there and you've got another four that have disappeared in the grass on my left. But what is interesting, there's not one adult at home. There's not one adult in the house. All the adults I cannot see, five of the females of the sausage tree pride. None of them is here. My guess is either last night or early this morning, and most early this morning, they went to get some food somewhere. Look at that one there, just resting her chin on top of that. A vast like tree, I'd call it a vast tree. It's broken, and I'm not sure what broke it, you see. It looks dry. And it's good that even me and Manu, who is on camera today, we are going, wow, how cool just to see this and the beauty of the Mara savanna with the Olorolo escarpment in the background there. And it's one place you just want to come, park your car, and get yourself a cup of coffee, and just keep watching without closing your eyes for hours and hours. So my guess is that one cub you see there belongs to King Tell because she got the tiniest or the youngest or the newest cubs in this particular pride. And yesterday, more than any other day, I was able to confirm almost 100% that she got three cubs and not two and not a four. At one point, we counted nine cubs. Then the number went up to 10. But by the time we left them yesterday, we counted 11. 11 with five females and one member of the Old Onyo Pike uh, males, that coalition. Not sure where the other one was, but I've been seeing one who have been keeping a very close eye on uh, this particular pride. Hello, you look so curious. 
Are you wondering where mom is? Gav, you're saying these cups look very well fed. Yes, I'll tell you what. Their mothers are wonderful mothers. They're very good when it comes to hunting. And I'm sure you know, we do not have the migration or the wildebeest in the thousands as most of them are in Tanzania, in Serengeti. So what is happening? They need to hunt some big game, giraffes, elands or buffaloes. But this particular pride have been doing very well in bringing buffaloes down. And of course, if they're well fed, it will definitely be the cubs are also in good shape. I just love the position, or I just love, I just love the posture of that particular, oops, you should not have gone to play, you should have remained where you are. I love the way she had her pose right there, laying her chin on the, uh, that huge branch, broken branch, and just looking at us. Clever animals like us are, because look carefully at how they're blending in. I mean, the cubs and the dried leaves. I'm sure they'll always first, you know, survey an area before committing their cubs. So definitely they left them here for a reason. It's either time to sharpen their teeth, close, and they will bite anything at the moment. I mean, because of their age, they're full of energy. And what they'll keep doing is to keep playing. So what I want to do Laramo to cute, always very good to hear your name. Let me give you a different angle, Laramo, and you tell me what you think of this. I'm sure you're gonna love it. Laramo, I hope you're still there. I'm giving you a different angle. You say too cute. I'm not sure now what you're going to say from this angle. Might want me move forward a bit again. Yeah. Yeah, I think we're gonna move forward. They are just becoming better and better and better position with time. So I gotta move another few meters so that you can have a better view of these cubs here. They're full of energy and just jumping up and down. Okay, cool. So there's broken a huge log there. And I'm just guessing hopefully that's why they're going to jump up and keep playing on top of it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be requesting you as you show, you know, one word, one word tweet on these cabs. What do you think on these cute cabs that are full of energy, jumping and down and resting the chins on this log? We've got three of them, of the seven that I had seen earlier. Let me know, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. I think Al Laramo just said, too cute. Most likely you might get a new one now, uh, Al Laramo, and tell me what do you think. Hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. As I guess now they're playing hide and seek maybe. I'm just trying to imagine where the mothers could be, but not. apart from imagining where the mothers could be, how far they are from here. So you've got that one on top of that log there, and I guess the other two, either they're communicating or playing their games as usual below that log. What can you smell? What are you looking on top of that tree? I'm not sure whether you know so much. Janice, you say precious. Thank you very much. This is truly precious to see such small little cubs entertaining us. What did Jerome say? Sorry, Nina. Flabbergast. A flabbergast, Romet. Yes, very good. Very good, Romet. How are you today? And I hope you're doing well. And yeah, once we hear of Kadogo and Gumba, as you asked me the other day, Romet, will definitely be letting you know. And I hope, Romit, you also watched the drama last night of the Marsh Pride and the All Over Pride going for each other. 
Caro, heartwarming. Thank you very much, Caro. It is truly heartwarming when, if Caro, you remember what happened yesterday, and you see cubs, I would guess more or less a little younger than what we uh, saw yesterday, just being so playful. It is truly heartwarming and it gives us all our spirits back, and we have reason to smile after we saw the heart uh, breaking. Uh, uh, infanticide or lion cubs uh, being mauled down. This is truly uh, heartwarming. Keep sending your tweets, hashtag Safan Live on Twitter. It could be one word, could be two words, could be three words. Uh, you're welcome to send us your feel because we truly appreciate that. Arizona, what would happen is if the mothers will go to a long distance if they notice the distance is long it's not worth you know having the cubs along with them and what happens unfortunately sometimes arizona the cubs will always spoil the hunt so we have noticed or we have seen lions after following them for very many years they will always give instructions to the cubs and will tell them you know what you do arizona stay put don't move and i tell you they do not move they remain here so they may go because most of these cubs are suckling cubs they may not have to you know they may not need to eat meat the mothers will go out go to the hunt and possibly you know eat before coming back and once they do that then they'll come and suckle their cubs they may choose to go back to the kill with the cubs or go eat again then come back we got some vultures on top of that tree well done manu and those are the lappet faced vultures Lapet faced vultures, which are the largest vultures that we got in Africa. And to see in one frame the cub there, and the vultures, and the torchwood trees, and the beautiful savannah, not forgetting the growing tall uh, red oat grass, it's just uh, beautiful. Jeff, that's a very good, pertinent question. Now, birds of prey are always a very big concern to cubs. Not what you see there. In general, vultures do hunt. In general, they do scavenge, if I may say that. But the biggest concern of these cubs here are the biggest birds of prey. And I'm talking of number one, the biggest culprit is the martial eagle. Once in a while, we have had crown eagles. But where we are, martial eagles I would point a finger to them. I mean, you see the escarpment in the background there. We've got some forests or some very heavy thickets there where we have seen uh, martial eagles either patching or nesting. And not once they have been known to fly down and using the very strong talent picking up lion cubs, which I would think would be a better way, not sure what I'm saying, but could be a better way of losing a lion cub than what we saw yesterday. So yeah, Jeff, you got a point there. That's the beautiful uh, Mara or all the escarpment, where once in a while you have seen martial eagles. Very rare cases we have had of crown eagles going for lion cubs, but martial eagles are the main birds of prey that will go for these cubs. It's all the all roll escapement, and you're back to a one cub. She has uh, repositioned herself, and see the position she is in now. If you'd not know there was anything there, you wouldn't see it. Caroline, how long will the mothers be away for? Caroline, I'll tell you what, I have no idea. I do not know when they left, and have no idea when they'll come back. But one thing, Caroline, I know for a fact, they will not be long because they need to come and suckle these cubs. They need to come and back and find out how they're doing because they may be facing a few uh, concerns. I'm talking of the hyenas, leopards, and as I just said, the martial eagles. Of all the big birds of prey, martial eagles have been known to grab such small little cubs. So it could be any time, Caroline. I am not going anywhere. We are staying here with Manu and hopefully we'll see uh, these lionesses come back. Or we might decide to drive around and keep looking where they could be. Because when you saw those two vultures up there, Caroline, we're like, wow, could there be a kill nearby? But 
when we left them here yesterday, the sausage pride, there was no prey of some sort. The nearest prey from where we are was some buffaloes and they were about miles away. It is possible they would have gone in that direction. And, you know, uh, we have agreed with the man we might head that, that way. Just to chance, because you never know. Because we know this pride, they're very good in bringing down buffaloes. Where are the other two of your friends? Are they under that log warming up or what are they doing? Now, they're equally clever cubs. I mean, they don't want to expose themselves very much. So by staying under the log, that's the best, I would say, the safest place for them to be in. Otherwise, up there where that one is, should you get a macho ego flying around from a distance? You're like, ah, I got some breakfast. So the vultures we saw there, unless, of course, they come down or they come for a dead uh, lion cub or like the lions, the cubs we saw yesterday, it's very unusual for them single-handedly to bring down a uh, live uh, lion cub. It's not very normal, not one that I know of. I'm trying to imagine from here what a direction I will take because I have, I can see buffaloes way ahead of me and the buffaloes, the herd that I saw yesterday, so the best bet is just to drive around and chance and see where the mamas or the mothers of these cubs could be. And as I make that decision, let's find out what Sleeping Tingana is doing. Well, David, we are patiently waiting. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any buffaloes around, um, and there's no mom of Tingana either that's going to come. So we're just patiently hoping that eventually, some point, Tingana is going to decide either to move towards the kill or just move in general. But we, at the moment, are not winning our patience battle. We are losing heavily at this stage um, as you can see he's really fast asleep the baboons are still sitting in the same spot still shouting at him so no one's really given way and, and moved or anything like that Tingana got a bit kind of nervy at one point because there was a male baboon that sort of moved fairly close um, and he kind of got his legs underneath him and he was almost looked as though he was about to run or charge and, and then the male baboon kind of shifted off towards a tree and climbed the tree and then he kind of rolled onto his side like you see him now so you know he's fine as long as they're not too close to him then he's generally okay with what's going on but I'm surprised with all the shouting of these baboons it's a lot of alarm calling that we haven't had a, a nosy hyena kind of arrive here and just check out what's going on often hyenas will be the first ones to arrive at any sort of alarm calls they come and check out what's going on and maybe even any other leopard or something like that but it's been well, quiet. We haven't seen anything really kind of moving around. It's just been the baboons and Tingana that's kept us company and a bit of rain, which is now eased off, thankfully. It's no longer raining nearly as much as what it was just now and has brightened up quite a bit, that's for sure. Now, we were saying that Tingana is looking in good condition at the moment, but you, you will be able to see... Okay, so before we get into Tingana's condition, uh, Kira, where do the baboons sleep at night? Um, well, it depends where they are, really, but generally they will aim to try and find an area with big, tall trees. Um, so they'll try and find somewhere where there's nice big jackalberries or um, tumbertis, or pretty much along drainage lines and lodges, essentially, because that's where most of your really nice big trees are. And then they get up into those trees and then they'll spend the night up there. Um, generally, it's a tree that's foliated, so they, they're not a huge fan of sitting in trees that are completely kind of bare of, of leaves. Um, um, if they can help it and then they'll try and kind of get in and then they sit there and they sleep up in the tree for the night come down in the morning and start to move around huh, very noisy this morning right now I was saying just now that you can see that Tingana is we're saying he's in good condition for his age and he's kind of full and his belly's quite big but if you look on his hip area now this is what you'll start to see as leopards start to get older is you'll notice that there's a slight depression there so 
what happens is with these guys is they start to have a bit of atrophy that starts to take place on on the hindquarters particularly um, and that will slowly but surely you'll find that their legs and their back ends start to get slimmer and slimmer and slimmer and they lose a little bit of weight through there now of course there's nothing to worry about on him he's absolutely fine but you can see there's just a slight depression that's starting to develop there in a big healthy adult male you don't really see that um, around the hip area so that will start to kind of happen and and it's obviously taken takes time for it to, to happen and it's not like we have to worry about Tingana today um, or going forward for the next six, seven months but you'll start to notice more and more that those hips just lose a little bit of definition um, and they start to get a little bit thinner and, and that will take place and so sometimes it's a way of helping with aging of, of these animals. Um, the older they get the more that kind of area starts to sink in a little bit and you start to get that more kind of atrophied look. Um, to their hip sections. Now, of course, he's in a lot better condition than he was this time last year, and so good meals and those kind of things do help with adding a bit of weight. Um, <clears throat> but he's going to get to the age where eventually it's, you know, it's not going to help him even if he eats a lot. He's going to still kind of have a little bit of loss of body condition. It's just unfortunately what happens when you age as an animal um, or as a person. There's not much you can really do about it, unfortunately. It's just the toll of being out here and moving around takes takes effect. What's interesting, though, is that, if, I mean, theoretically, Tingana at this stage is looking the way he is, and, and, and you know, he's going to go into a winter period now, and generally winter is a very good time for our predators. They normally do quite well um, as the, the prey animals get weaker, and, and then at this rate, if we don't get a huge amount of rain over the course of the next couple, well, next month or so, it's going to be what's probably going to be deemed a green drought. So it's going to be very difficult from a water point of view but food there should be a, more than enough food for the animals to survive at this stage but that might mean that there'll be a lot of weak animals which will theoretically be good for Tingana he's going to be able to sorry what a fly that's hitting me in the face um he's going to be able to you know find food fairly regularly and and so let's say that that happens and then he goes into the lambing season and does all right there you know another year of Tingana being around is is a is a long time and and It'll be interesting to see how old Tingana actually goes. Of course, most males are generally expected to be sort of 12 to 13 when they start to deteriorate quite fast and become nomadic and, and then obviously die off. Whereas, you know, he at this stage is, if he can get through a good year of, of feeding, which this year promises probably to be fairly decent in terms of being able to um, sustain himself, then he'll be facing sort of, look, starting to look more along the lines of 14 um, and if he can make it that far, then he's done incredibly well. Um, the oldest male that I've seen personally is probably Campan. Um, he made it, I think, to almost 16 um, when he when he died, which is incredibly old for a male leopard. So I wonder if Tingy's going to be one of those. I, funny enough, don't really like it though when the males get too old. I, I think it's always so sad to watch an animal that was so magnificent to to kind of deteriorate to the point where they you know like a mvula where it becomes just skin and bones um and and you kind of it, they lose a lot of their majesty when they like that and it's almost like they suffer their way through their last few months which i never really enjoy um i think it's sometimes in some ways better when a dominant male leopard starts to kind of lose his way and becomes nomadic that he you know unfortunately dies in some sort of a quick event where he doesn't have to suffer for weeks on end with uh, you know basically starving to death I think that's always the worst way for an animal to go it's never pleasant for something to walk around with no teeth and kind of like I say basically starving you can imagine as a person how how difficult that would be to go through and so you don't really want to see that in an animal um, so hopefully it won't be that way. I mean, it's always a shock when animals get killed in a quick event, but I always find in an old animal it's probably better than kind of the suffering that can take place for days in, days out. Anyway, so a bit of a morbid topic we got onto there. I don't know how we descended into that area, but it's kind of where we went with it unfortunately i suppose this is part of spending a lot of time with the sleeping cat is that you start devolving into all kinds of different topics that are related to them and you know i suppose that's part of it now i believe a number of you are agreeing with the fact that you you know it's nice to see a quicker end rather than a um slow kind of painful death now you can see with the screaming of the baboons tingy is trying to move 
but not too much that he gets seen. You see how he's trying to keep his head down the whole time? So as much as he wants to look up and see what the baboons are doing, he also knows that if he pops his head up, he's going to get shouted at a lot more. So he's kind of trying to position himself and re-shuffle, sort of shuffle, but still stay as low as possible. It's actually been quite entertaining to watch him try and hide away as best he can. Of course, he's not hidden at all, and he's been shouted at still, but he's trying to get comfortable and kind of shift and move without sort of being too brazen about his movements and I have a feeling that these baboons are going to shout at him for quite a lot longer during the course of today and it's not going to be the most comfortable thing unless he decides he's had enough and just kind of pops his head up but you see look you see how he's trying to look around but he doesn't want to lift his head too high out of the grass he's kind of trying to keep it down as much as possible but still be able to see what's going on Tingy, are the baboons upsetting your sleep boy? seems like it See how he just tries to get his head down when he sees that the baboons are kind of looking in his way. It's that typical sort of camouflage that a leopard will do. It's almost as though he's hunting in many respects. You know, when they hunt, they kind of put their head down like that. And of course, he's not hunting these baboons. He's just really trying to hide away as best he can and keep his profile as low as possible. And often we talk about when we walk a leopard or we go into an area and we're tracking leopards, we say that they'll see you and then they'll go flat. This is a prime example of what we're talking about. So the way that he's doing this is the same way he would do um, if a person approached and he didn't want to move is that he'll try and kind of just look over the top of the glass and stay as low as possible to try and camouflage and make sure that he's not seen but he can still see you kind of walking past and that's why often we miss a leopard if we're not in the right sort of place to spot them um, and, and you can kind of go right past them. Good. We're going to stay here. He's moved a lot more in the last little bit than he has in a while, so we'll just see if maybe he's going to stand up at some point. In the meantime, though, back over to Oily, see how he's doing this morning. Listen to that squirrel alarming. facing because it's angry. I will take my binos because on top of the tree thing. Because we are on our way to the western direction and where we at right now it's where Tandy was spotted, was last seen yesterday. So I think I'll just go in this area over here. Can you hear it? It's crazy. And then I, I can't show you this squirrel because it's on top of a tree and we have a roof here. Hopefully we'll find something here. Let me check for the tracks. Where is Will now? Just kept quiet, but I'll just look in these tall and long grasses. We have the fresh tracks of a run, running antelope here coming from a direction going there. Hopefully we'll find something just around the bushes. Crossing fingers. I'll just stop there and listen again. Oh, it's thick. and listen again. This girl has stopped. Oh, 
I don't know which direction to go now because I couldn't see exactly the squirrel where it was facing. But I will make a turn here because I don't know want to off-road for for something I I can't really see. If I saw fresh tracks, I would have off-roaded it. But I'll stay on the road and maybe I'll be the luckiest guy this morning. Oh, no. Oh, baboon tracks, confusing. I thought they are leopard tracks. They are so confusing. Oh, so while I'm searching and searching, but I'm, I'm positive. For now, let's go and see these fluffy little things with David Kitu. I'm very convinced, Oli, you'll be a lucky boy at the end of the day because this one cub won't bite the tail of the other. And for those of you who know who this, this particular pride very well, there's one Leoness who is the oldest that we call King Tail, and we call her so because she got a bent on her tail. And we do not know what might have transpired for that to happen. And we have always had our own theories. And we think maybe either another lioness or a lion could have beaten it way back. And then, you know, she never recovered. We do not know. So not sure this one is trying to do the same. And the other one just looking at her. Please stop that. I'm not sure I'm happy. Or oh, I don't like what exactly you are doing. It's not right. We've been waiting here since uh, the last time we were with you hoping that the females will, go, will resurface and they have not. And we're making a decision of trying to move and find out the possible places there would be. So we have to look for either vultures on top of trees or buffaloes. So as you say, this makes you so happy. Yes, you only have one thing to do to be full of joy. If especially you saw what happened uh, last evening, uh, definitely this should give you happiness and nothing else but happiness. But we still got lots of cabs in the Masumara. We still got lots of cabs that are doing very well. Now, the mothers definitely must have gone for a hunt. And I said, we'll either be looking for some vultures on top of trees or just look where I would see a huge herd of buffalo and chance to see the mothers because that's the only place they would be. They cannot be anywhere else. Susan, what happens is you like to know how the dynamics of lions go in terms of denning their cubs. If each one pride, they give birth at different times. Sometimes they are separated by a week, a month or two. It depends. You see every female, depending on where maybe the labor comes in or depending on where they are at a particular time, it's very unusual to see a particular lioness going to an area where another lioness gave birth, although it is possible. Now, this particular pride, there are five females, and I think all of them got cubs, and three of them gave birth at dens that we easily identify. Two we do not know, but the three Susan that we know were very different, but not very far from each other. I'm sure Susan, you know, that lions are very territorial, so they tend to keep in the same area as much as they'll keep shifting once in a while. I mean, imagine these three have agreed, one that is on the right of your screen, to have a nap. I think she is flat asleep. I'm not sure looking under the tail whether it's a boy or a girl. Manu, what do you think? It's a boy. Manu thinks a boy. Are you sure, Manu? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll trust you, Manu. You have better eyes than me from where you are. So that boy is sleeping. We don't know who the other two are, but you can see he is in dreamland. In general, males sleep more than females. 
And of course, if it's a boy, I'm not surprised. He have started to do his thing early as typical males. <sighs> Sleeping. Alison, the easiest way to tell male cubs from female cubs is only one, to look under their tails. We have made a few mistakes once in a while where we have thought that that one, because a bit dark, is a female. That one, because a bit light, it's a male. And then we have been proved wrong by the same cubs. So Alison, I would say, to be 110% sure, always look at the cab in, in that particular age. But once Alison, they start going three, four, five months, you'll easily pick it up. The males will start showing that correct of being masculine. They start showing a bit of more of their fur around the neck, getting longer than in the females. That's where that time you can tell. But at this particular age, we are very lucky. You've seen that one on the right, you can see the testicles there, and he is a boy. The two that are looking at us, no idea, Alison. We can only guess, but I'm sure with time, you know, ideally, time will tell who they are. Hello. Thank you for being awake. Thank you for looking. Oh, looks good. Good morning. What I usually do not know is, would they be able to know when the mothers are coming or not? I have no idea. Luis, you say they are beautiful. And who would not want to see lion cubs, Luis? And especially in the morning like this. We were with them here yesterday. We followed them for about a mile. And they brought us here. But before they brought us here, they went and found themselves a water pan. Passing the water pan, man, what do you do? I the camera to me this morning. This is from my pride. And that was to me one of the best, uh, I'll say, lion sighting of man. I went out on the road with the five females and I walked with them for like a whole five minutes. special. I was telling man, they look like goats on the road. Anyhow, then I thought, let's just frog march them and we move in front of them and then we could just fill in them as they were coming towards us. But shortly after, they decided to detour and enter the grass. And I'm like, oh no. Anyhow, we followed them slowly and I found a water pan somewhere. And I said, you know what? In my heart, chances are these lions might be going for a drink. And that's exactly what they did. It was amazing to see the adults and the cubs quenching their thirst in that particular water hole. Then after that, we saw this broken tree there under, and I thought, because it's getting a little warm, it's getting a little hot, they'll definitely go and look for some shade for the rest part of the day. And they did exactly that. I was full of joy yesterday morning. And then it was time to move on, and we left them. And somehow, by not trusting they could be in the same spot, I thought, well, that place was too open. As you can see, that tree, that's, that's the only cover that is here. I guessed, chances are, it could be too cold for the cubs. And the mothers will take them in a much warmer place or in a kind of a den or some thickets. I was wrong. The cubs are still here. I've seen total seven. I've seen these three. And the other four must be behind us somewhere in the grass. We didn't want to follow them because of the tall grass and the boulders in that particular area. So you might see another vehicle pulling on or pulling in. Uh, we'll always try and share information as much as we can with our friends and they may also benefit from the same. Either these cabs know us so well, you notice how relaxed she was or they were until the other vehicle came in and she was like, mm, who are you? We only know David and Manu. But after some time, you can see she has warmed up, relaxed, and still looking right at my face. I'm not sure whether I would communicate with you. I don't know what I would tell you.
killing, what should happen here is all lions, or we all know that lions are very social. And what would happen, these three could be siblings. Of course, we sometimes you say blood is thicker than water. And they'll have that little uh, commonality. You know, if your brother's here, let's move together. Because the four that I saw moving behind could be belonging to the one family that we call Mitty. And then these three, if you look at them carefully, they look to be the same age. And I'm guessing these are kink tails. It's very possible that, you know, siblings will stay together. So you'll get uh, a particular set or a particular litter of one female in terms of being separately. And, oh, sorry, that's just my zip because it's a little bit warm. At the end of it, or in close for of also to take care of each other. Come on, everybody, stay under the tree, stay under the grasses, stay under these branches. And what a position to be on that particular uh, termite mound at the base of that tree. My thinking is that termite mound could be exuding some kind of warmth to them. That's exactly they are right there. Apart from blending in, we know, or I imagine, there are loads of termites under there. And because of the body activity of the body heat, a lot of it is being dissipated. And that's what they are benefiting from. Cabbies, do you have an idea when mom will come back? Well, they have no idea when mom will come back. But on top of the tree there, I know you can hear some birds that are just making noise. And those are the white-bellied goy, but you can't see them very well. They're on top of the tree, but those are white-bellied goy. But I'm not very sure why Tingana does not want to wake up and give us some bit of action that David gets to see them. We have been had serious patience pants on this morning and have not been rewarded. In fact, it's been six hours of patience pants between last night and this, this morning. And yes, Tingi has <laughs> given us very, very, very little. I'm surprised, to be honest, that he hasn't gone and at least had a little bit of a nibble in the time that we've been sitting with him. Are you waking up now, boy, or not? A bit of a stretch and kind of no, I think he's just very, very happy with where he is at the moment. I don't think he really wants to go anywhere. He's got himself a little pillow now. There's a fallen over branch in amongst the grass that is the perfect place for him to lay his head and have a little bit of a kind of nap on the pillow of grass and wood. Um, and he can then fall asleep properly. So I don't think we're going to spend too much longer with him. Um, well, I was hoping that we would get some semblance of movement out of him this morning, but... Alas, the Duke is tired and therefore quite sleepy. But before we go anywhere, I actually want to try and have a little look at the carcass, see if we can get a bit of a view for you guys. Um, I'm just going to have to turn the car slightly. Tingy is not even waking up at the start of a vehicle. It's delightful. Right. Careful there, Craig. We've got dripping water. Now, the carcass should be directly in front of us. I'm not sure Craig's going to be able to see any of it, given how kind of overgrown it is but don't worry Craig I'm gonna try and position us slightly differently let's try and go forward here and then like over my right shoulder maybe is where we're gonna get this right let's have a look Craig let's see what you can get when you go in there so there you can kind of see it let me roll forward a bit Craig it's gonna be better if I roll a little bit for you there we go I think that's gonna be a bit better so inside there is where the carcass is. Um, now you can see a sort of one side of it is coming towards us, which is still quite whole, um, which is that side. And then it kind of goes off away from us, and there's a bit of red that you can see where he's eaten in the back. Now how much of that carcass has actually been fed upon, I'm not quite sure. Um, very tricky to kind of see in amongst this um, to be able to discern exactly how much 
has been eaten, but there still looks like a serious amount of meat that is left on there. If you just kind of figure out how far it goes from left to right in the frame, that's a good day's meal, maybe even two days left on it. So hopefully he'll hoist it in this tree next to us at some point, and then we'll be able to actually get a full kind of idea of how much is actually left. I'm trying to look myself to see how big it is, but it's really not very easy to see in amongst all of that. I'm also trying to work out which side is which, to be honest with you. Oh, the head is this side, Craig. Okay, so he's eaten a bit of the rump, but there's still a lot of food inside there. Tingy, this afternoon you need to be better than what you've been this morning. You need to wake up a little bit. So we're going to go and scratch around and maybe just do a little loop about. There were some Franklins that were alarm calling not too far from here. So we're going to go and just see what they were shouting at. Probably a bird of prey or something like that. Also, let's just wait for all of this to dribble out. Sorry. We're at an angle now, so it's the perfect way to just kind of let all the water that's accumulated on the roof dribble out so it doesn't hit me. You may see it kind of coming out there, so that's what we're kind of waiting for. Oh, Craig, this is perfect. We've done this the right way. It's all gone off the front so that I don't get my legs and head wet which is very very pleasant good now we're going to leave some spots but it sounds like Molly has found some stripes for all of you yes indeed I have this stripey donkeys not stripey horses that's what I call these zebras because of this beautiful stripy coloration. If you can look now, they are grazing. If you look at their faces, they have these strong black muzzles. And uh, the upper lip is movable. And they use this upper lip to push grasses between their incisors and then snip the grass off that's what they do and they we prefer short grasses suddenly they can go for tall grasses oh we have a youngster on top there that's the youngster i think this is a uh, the herd I've, I've seen yesterday hello youngster this is pure beauty if I can say we also have this beautiful impalas and we normally see antelopes in one area and this is called mutualism because the zebras just grazes and uh, <coughs> the impalas are both grazes and browsers oh look at that And this coloration, it's, it looks as if it's been painted by an artist. Yeah. This species is so beautiful. Wow. Maybe, yes, I also love seeing zebras because of their skin, I, I can say. I just love them. I also love them a lot. And uh, what I al also like about these zebras, every time they get frightened or they just run or start running, they will fight like, all the time. It's because of the gases in their stomach that's why you always see them bloated <laughs> i've never seen a zebra skinny unless it's been uh, locked in a cage for years but these ones normal zebras they always look fat what you normally see is their mane 
lying down or just fallen on the side. That's when you can tell that the zebras are, are not feeling well. Ingrid, yes, it has been painted by an artist. It, it doesn't look like uh, skin, like if I can tell you. It looks like this piece of art on your wall there with the black and white stripes. It doesn't look anything like a coat. And you can think that these stripes are the same, but all the zebras have different stripes like our fingerprints. And they look so big, hey, and the full grown zebra can weigh up to 320 kilograms. And that's huge. And going back to its uh, mouth part there, they have these sharp incisors that they can bite. Because sometimes when they are being hunted by lions, they can bite, they can bite. So for now, I'm still searching for Tandy because of that squirrel. Let uh, me take you up to the north with David Kitu. Keep searching, keep searching only. Tandy, Tandy might show up, might show up. So I have decided to leave uh, our cabs and that I should just drive in this ocean of grass in this ocean of grass. I'll first stop here for a couple of seconds and you see what I'm talking about when I talk of ocean of grass. I mean, it's long grass. And I'm imagining if it's some type of cereal, it is just great to see it. And maybe go look or find out where these sausage guards are. Look at that amount of grass that will wait for a couple of more months before we get the migration here. I'm talking about wild beast and zebras because there's a toppy there and toppies uh, cannot do much. Toppies will always want to get the soft grass. So this is just too big for them, maybe not even palatable to them. And there's, uh, there's an eagle there, but more of the tall grass there. So I want to chance to see this tall grass because they could be anywhere and a lot of surprised. So what you want to look for is buffaloes. Anyone will see buffaloes will be right place to maybe see these females. But in the meantime, how beautiful is that? Excellent. Now, let's, let's move, let's move. We have time to find out where the female sausages are. I wouldn't expect them to be very far from those cubs. But as much as I've seen them Sometimes, there's a time I saw Limpy. Limpy is one of the females in that pride. I saw her about two, three miles away from the cubs. And if you all remember, originally Limpy had two cubs and she lost one. And nobody knows what's happened to that particular one. And it's like now, when the lionesses go look for food, that their cubs become very vulnerable. So hopefully nothing goes wrong. In that place, we have left them such a strategic place just to blend in and to hide very well. If we did not know they were there from yesterday, we wouldn't even see them. But just because we were there yesterday and we saw them, that's how we ended up going to the same place. Lots of grass, as I said earlier, I'll call it an ocean of grass because it's just too long and we'll be very lucky to see anything moving.
versus the kitchen you're asking how many cubs can one lioness get it's between one and four in normal circumstances for new mothers they'll get one for little older mothers they'll get two three and sometimes four so anything between one to four is okay but the average or the standard is two in that particular pride we got limpy that was talking about who had two cubs there's another one female who we have yet to give a name who got two cubs pretty old and now king tail being the oldest of the females that pride got three so it varies and then we also think there's one other female there who we think is the youngest that got one cub so anything one to four it is within the normal so age in general determines the number of cubs they get the older the females are the more now apart from grass here i haven't seen anything else from a distance i can see some ellis not what exactly i'm looking for but it's always nice to hear of a leopard sitting up well we were about to leave tingana and we kind of had gone across the damn wall and then noticed that he had perked up quite a bit and was yawning and He's been scratching and kind of looks as though he's about to get going. So we thought we'd just wait a little bit longer from up top here and just see what he gets up to. He's looking around a lot as if to see if the baboons are actually gone before he makes his next move. Um, but he's far more awake than what we saw earlier, that's for sure. So I'm hoping that he's going to get up and go. We had a good look at his carcass. When we kind of go out of that, when we left the sighting, there was actually a really nice gap. He's hardly eaten this kudu. There is very, very little that he's eaten. He's just eaten a small little piece off the rump and plucked it of fur. Um, so I'm pretty sure, there we go, he's up now, which is good news for us. Hopefully he's going to move. Hello, boy. Good morning. So I think it's now that the baboons have left the area. That's why he's actually moving. He's seen now that no one's shouting at him when he stands up. Um, and so it's, he has the ability now to actually kind of move around without attracting too much attention to himself and inciting too much chaos. And that's probably why he's a lot more kind of perky and awake. Let's shake off all the rain that he's got on him at the moment. Now if he starts walking towards the carcass then we'll try and quickly shoot down to the bottom of the, back to where we were because there is one gap that we might be able to get a view of him. It's going to be a bit tricky but we'll we'll try and figure it out as to how we're actually going to get to see it via the roof. Yes he is going that way. All right Craig let's try and go around quickly. It's going to take us a few minutes just to get around but we'll try and do it fairly fast. Yes, I know this is the wrong way to go to where we need to be, but I unfortunately do need to turn around somehow. Oof. Four minutes. Craigie, yeah, I don't know if we're going to make four minutes. <laughs> Let's try and see if we can get there in four minutes. It's going to be a quick... Here we go. We'll try and see if we can get there in the time frame that we have. We're also in low range, so driving too fast is not going to be easy, but anyway, let's try and get there and see if we can get him just feeding on the carcass a little bit. It would be nice if he took the carcass up into the tree in four minutes, but I doubt that's going to actually happen. I'm pretty sure we're going to just see him go and having a little feed. Of course, he would wait until the end. Typical Tingana, last minute leopard that does these kind of things. Craig, you still on there? There we go. Craig's all right, he'll survive, don't worry everybody. He's a resilient fella. Okay, so he has settled to where the carcass is. Now I've got to try and get somewhere where I can give you a little bit of height so you can actually see what's going on. So Craig, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in like this, and I'm gonna try and reverse us up this hill a little bit so that we can have a shot through the back end here. Hold on, Greggy. We're almost there. I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but...
How are we doing there, Craig? Are we good? Is the roof in the way now? Oh, this roof, I hate this roof. I'm trying to kind of figure out some way to get you guys to be able to see him feeding. And there was actually not a bad kind of view, but this roof is killing us. There we go, Craig. I think you'll be able to go straight in there and see him kind of feeding on the kill itself. There we go. So we made it with two minutes to spare, which is good news. But there you can kind of see the kill. If we didn't have the roof, we would have had a little bit more elevation to be able to actually see properly um, him feeding. But you can see there is a lot of meat still on there. He's really just eaten a small little chunk out of the rump. But I'm going to keep quiet and just listen for his teeth crunching. So you can hear there that he's just feeding off that kind of hip bone area at the moment and then that carcass kind of lies in front of him so he's still got a long way to go and hopefully he's going to eat a little bit like this lighten it up and then up into the tree it's going to be for this afternoon safari where his view of him will be a lot better but at least we made it and we got a bit of kind of excitement out of tingana in the end so we were rewarded after some patience unfortunately though it is that time of the day where we need to say goodbye to all of you as we are going to head back dry off get some breakfast and well david in the mara is going to have a long drive home he's got a long way to get back to where he needs to be but hopefully you've enjoyed the morning it's been a fairly relaxed quiet morning after yesterday's chaos um, and i think a far more pleasant one in terms of many things so from all of us it's been an absolute pleasure hopefully we will see you all this afternoon on our sunset safari.